listening to The Starting Zone. This is The Starting Zone's live call-in show, where we hear questions from you, our patrons. And now, here are your hosts. Well, hello and welcome to The Starting Zone, the podcast about World of Warcraft, the people who play it. Today is August 26, 2022, and as the sultry voice of Coltrane mentioned at the top of the show, it is our August patron Q&A episode that we like to do. My name is Spencer Downey. I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, Jason Lucas. Jason, how are you doing this fine Friday night? Uh, Spencer, hello. I'm doing well. And uh, yes, thank you, patrons, for making these bonus shows possible. And uh, man, we got we got a lot of people uh, uh, ready to participate tonight. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great show. People got a lot to say about what's going on in the game and, and around it and coming up soon. So that's awesome. That's why we do these. That's what we want to hear. Exactly. So we asked our patrons because uh, we always like to have sort of a conversation starter. Uh, what were their thoughts on season four and faded? Because we've now seen an entire rotation of the raids. We have now seen a lot of the Mythic Plus changes and those have really slowed down. Um, although there still have been some more tweaks even this past week with uh, Takarazan. Um, but we sort of wanted to know how people were feeling. Get get that gauge, hear what people's thoughts were. But of course, we always answer these first. So Jason, how, what are your thoughts on season yeah. four so far? Uh, I, I'm very, for the most part, I'm very pleasantly surprised with season four. Um, I thought that having 31 bosses in the, in the rotation, in the pool for rating was going to be overwhelming and, um, potentially kind of ridiculous. I feel like most of the bosses are fresh enough, even, you know, from Nathria, which we hadn't seen for over a year that it's not too bad. Like getting, getting back into the swing of like, okay, how does this boss work and everything hasn't been too bad. And it's actually really cool to have that variety of like, okay, what what's on the menu this week? Like, which bosses are we doing? That's pretty cool, actually. Um, and of course, at some point, we'll be moving into a space of what do we want to prioritize this week? Because we could do anything. Uh, I think that's going to feel really nice, too. I think the, uh, the Cypher system to upgrade gear is really handy. I think that's a cool thing. Um, I don't, as we kind of talked about uh, on the main episode this week, I don't love the fact that it's sort of inspires me to do lower level content than I really want to do. Like, you know, do an LFR or something for drops is such a sucker deal. Um, so it, you know, it just never feels good. But then again, if you have that item that you really, you know, you need to get to, uh, you, you want to upgrade that item level in that slot. That's really cool. I think the Dinar system is great because it lets you target, you know, a specific thing that's crucial to your build in many cases and just have it. And then again, you can upgrade it with the ciphers. Um, that feels really great. Um, Raid gameplay feels good. I don't love the faded affixes. I don't think they're necessary strictly. I don't think they add a whole lot except for confusion and maybe performance hits on the game overall, especially with a couple of them. Um, I feel like it, there'd be just with the sheer amount of variety and the different combos you can do with, with mixing and matching gear from different raids at, you know, comparable item level. I think that's enough for, you know, kind of a, a wacky season like this to wrap up an expansion. So um, that said, I think most of the faded affixes don't feel too bad to deal with, except Creation Spark. I think Creation Spark is just incredibly disruptive. Um, and it it doesn't really pay off, right? Like it asks a lot of you and it doesn't uh, – it's a nice buff, but it doesn't feel as good as the bad feels of how do you – warp your strategy around this affix and how do you avoid you know losing because you didn't pay enough attention to it um i i think you could you could just do faded you know whatever whatever you want to call it style raid rotation without that and other than that that's really my biggest complaint about the raid structure and i really wasn't looking forward to the way the stuff was coming together you know i didn't i didn't really want these raids rotating through like this and and having these extra layers on top of them so it's been better than i maybe feared at you know at its worst or something um mythic plus i think has been amazing um i was really kind of dreading some of the mythic plus changes that were coming in i think the straightforward but really powerful seasonal affix is kind of perfect for where we're at right now i think coming in with no valor cap and no kind of ramp up week of end of dungeon drops and stuff like that was fantastic. It really encouraged me and a lot of people I know to play and put time into dungeons and kind of start working our way back up through the system and solving the new puzzles. 
I was afraid that the dungeon pool was going to be terrible or the dungeons were going to feel really bad. And I think seven out of eight ain't bad. Um, Lower Kara, you know, Lower Kara was a problem back in the Legion days. Uh, They've hacked it apart, but it's still pretty much, I would say, clearly harder than the field for the most part. Yeah, but removing the ushers being one of the most recent mm-hmm. changes was, I, that was a, a change I never saw coming ever. Yeah. I mean, there's so many of them, you know, in the original incarnation of the dungeon and they're so dangerous. Um, yeah, I just, I, I thought like, Oh, you know, grim rail depot is going to be horrendous. And, you know, I don't know how, uh, how Karazan's going to hold up. I don't know how it's going to feel going back to, uh, Mechagon, as it turns out, going back to Mechagon feels pretty great. And, um, you know, Upper has its moments of frustration, but overall, I think it's actually pretty good, fine. It's not, decently it's a decently fun run most of the time. Not having to do the puzzle on the last boss in Upper is a really nice win. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, I think it's just uh, the pool. The pool overall feels really good. I, I think, you know, I haven't done lower since they've done a lot of these big changes, so we'll see kind of how that falls in the line. But I thought that Mythic Plus was going to be maybe – almost like a chore or something. I was just afraid that it really wasn't going to feel good to do, but I've been having a great time with it. I've I've done more dungeons um, like at this, through this point in the season than I I think I did in any other season, this expansion, because it feels very rewarding and fun and people are tuned up to do it. You know, the people that I play with want drops, they want valor. Uh, All that stuff is there. So, um, you know, I think overall, like the the Valor system and and Mythic Plus rating system and, and the way they kind of go together is not new to season four, obviously, and that's something that we've seen kind of spring up alongside Shadowlands. I think that stuff is great and a big win for the system. But what's really great about it in in this particular case with season four is you can pull max item level upgrades, you know, after the first week, and then you could take them straight over to the creation catalyst and your creation catalyst probably had a ton of charges banked up. So there was like the ramp was like just vertical, you know, <laughs> like season four starts and you're just replacing stuff immediately, upgrading at 20 plus item levels. Like it felt great. So, um, yeah, overall, like I, I think I had, you know, I had some trepidation about some elements of it. And for the most part, I've been wrong. I I was wrong about most of that stuff I was afraid of or or wasn't really looking forward to. And I'm having a great time with it. I think there's a lot of, a lot of lessons here to carry forward. And I think stuff like the upgrade ciphers and Dinar should probably carry forward. I think probably no valor cap should carry forward. Um, you know, you probably still have the ramp up week for item level because if you're going to stagger heroic and mythic raid opening, if you're going to do that, then you probably do need that that week of ramp up. But, you know, I, I think a lot of the stuff they kind of swung for the fences on this season works really well. I, I guess the question is, are they comfortable with it, you know, early in an expansion or is this an end of expansion treat? Because I got to say, like, we talked a lot about wanting season four to be that, like, victory lap. And... It didn't feel like that as much the first week or two in raid. Um, I, I I can definitely admit that, but this week, our second time through Nathria definitely felt like that victory lap, like three minute boss fights, pretty much all the way through up until the Nathrias with Creation Spark, which was a you know a new puzzle to solve. But um, yeah, I you know I think that's what a lot of players really wanted out of this experience was just kind of revisit some of this stuff and just power up and have fun and. Um, I don't like maybe we could just have fun all the time when an expansion comes out and it's not, you know, <laughs> we don't just, yeah. yeah, we're not going to take the, the, the leashes off the shackles off and, and go nuts and have fun only at the end of the expansion. Like that would be okay with me. So I'm, I'm really pleased. I mean, there's stuff I still want to hit in, in season four. I don't have any portals or anything unlocked yet. So I want to hit some twenties, but, um, you know, that's about it. And that, that seems pretty doable considering the tuning and, and the crew that I'm running with and just kind of everybody's attitude right now. So I think it's great. And it's a great way to send off this expansion and move into a new expansion because normally we'd be farming the same raid for eight months or 11 months or 14 months or whatever. And just, yeah, Mythic Plus is there, but it's the same old dungeons. This is, you know, I, I think they, they really... They got a lot more right than wrong with uh, with this experiment, so I, I think it bodes well for the future. I agree with that. I, I think they definitely got more right than wrong. I will say that 
Um, the victory lap is not something I've experienced uh, in Mythic Raiding. Um, our, our, the, the scene of Mythic Raiding when it comes to what they're balancing and stuff goes with. I guess I'll start, I'll start with the negative, uh, since we're coming off of a, a positive from you, and then I can sandwich it with the positive things I like about Season 4. Um, the, the Mythic tuning has just been way off. Uh, it's so much so that our raid team basically just holds vo votes every week as to whether or not we want to actually bother with the last few bosses inside these raids. Um, so this week, for example, uh, we raided Tuesday, cleared up until uh, Stone Legion Generals, and then spent about an hour on Stone Legion Generals before we were like, okay, well, that's sort of the end of our raid time. Didn't get it. Came back the next day, went and did Jailer Mount to get people their Jailer Mounts and whatnot. And once we finished killing Jailer and getting people some of their mounts, held a vote and just said, do we want to go back and do Stone Legion? And the majority of the raid said no. Like, the majority of people were like, no, I don't want to go back and spend time on that boss and then spend time on Denathrius, particularly with Creation Spark going on Denathrius. It just didn't make sense. And so if you have people who have the time, like, we we had, we were, would have tonight as well as raid time. Like, there was the time yesterday to spend the other half of our raid on that. There was time tonight to raid uh, the full night tonight. Having the time to raid and making the decision... Yeah, no, we don't feel it's worth doing. We don't feel like that's worth our time and energy to do that. That's a big problem with the game um, inside this season. And a lot of that comes down to the affixes just not being something that are very enjoyable to deal with. Um, the uh, raids themselves for Mythic often being uh, unforgiving enough or uh, not, I guess. So here's here's like an interesting thing for Stone Legion, right? Um, being able to push before a set of skirmishers spawn is a really helpful thing for your team. Not that it's required. If you do the mechanics properly, you can kill the boss and everything's... But if you're trying to make a victory lap raid that you only have access to once every three weeks, you should probably not put in... like you know, make, make the DPS checks to reach those points hard enough to be able... For teams to not be able to reach them, right? Like we were using heroism to try and push past that skirmish thing. And sometimes we were and sometimes we weren't to make the, the intermission that much easier. And it's an interesting thing to me to be like, why are we needing to do this? Why is the, why is this boss high enough on hit points that we need to do, like we need to use the affix properly and we need to be, you know, really trying to meet these DPS checks. That's not what it feels like this period of time of rating should be. I feel like this should be the time where you go back, you revisit it, you have a good time and you get a bunch of loot. Because you're handing loot out anyways with ciphers and with dinars. Why not just hand loot out in raids too? Who cares? Like people, people who never got to see these bosses back when they were progression content earlier this expansion now gets a chance to go in and see the mythic mechanics. But it should it should be the mythic mechanics without actually having to really worry about pushing and executing and progressing on these bosses. And the fate of day fix obviously adds to the progression aspect. So I that's that's kind of the the negative for me, is I feel like normal heroic faded they just they nailed it like i think their mark was really 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 good um for those difficulties and i feel like mythic they just overshot it again like they did they did it again right they, they admitted that they did it with this last year and they just did it again with faded where they just overshot the mark the raids are tuned for teams that are you know in that top uh 20 us top 200 or 150 world kind of range and everyone else beyond that is either not going to clear it inside their given week or suffers through it to be able to clear it in their week. And you shouldn't be suffering. As you said, this should be a victory lap. So it's uh, it's unfortunate that, uh, you know, it, it's so much so that raid teams are just saying, it's just not worth the time. It's just why bother, right? Like, we are just going to replace this gear in a couple of months. So this is really, we're supposed to be doing this for fun and having a good time. This isn't a good time. Let's just not do it. That's, that's a, a, a tough pill to swallow when it comes to content like this. Now, as far as the other stuff in Season 4, um, Mythic Plus I think is great. Uh, I really, really enjoy both the Affix because I, I think it's fairly simple and it's just permanent stat gain and you choose the stat at the beginning and it feels good without having to worry about gaming a system in some way. As long as you can dodge a frontal and dodge a big swirly on the ground, which sometimes can be underwater and impossible to see, um, you know, then you're good, right? Then then you're you're totally fine with, with this Affix. I think they, they hit that mark really well. No Valor Cap, like you mentioned, was great. It was definitely an encouragement to run more than 10 Mythic Plus dungeons a week because you were constantly getting a reward for it. It's also an encouragement for players who maybe stopped doing a daily loop, doing their callings, 
to start doing those things again to earn a little bit more really easy valor on the side. Maybe when you're trying to find an M plus group for a particular one you, dungeon you want to run and grind some rating for, you're just out doing your callings and able to earn some extra stuff that way. Um, I do feel like legendaries are fairly easy to craft, although I, I still feel like often the base items are a little bit more expensive than I'd like to be spending at this point in the season. Um, so that's a little disappointing. Uh, but I am still glad that uh, that it's fun to run that content. We want to be running that content. The Dinar system's great. I would 100% support the Dinar system coming back every season as a regular thing. Um, I would even potentially look at including Mythic Plus rewards in one of those vendors. Uh, if it's, again, it's just trinkets and weapons is all that we are able to purchase from these vendors. So why not, you know, throw in some Mythic Plus trinkets and, vent and weapons into those vendors as well? It would certainly be something I could consider uh, seeing inside that because often those are the pieces that are really sought after and challenging to get. And things you don't want to refarm every season. So the Dinar kind of helps you with that refarm every season concept. Uh, Ciphers, I think, could be adjusted. Um, I think Ciphers is, is a system where they've, they implement it with an idea of how long it's supposed to take your average player to earn one of these tokens. And I feel like if that's a, let's say three week period, let's make that assumption that's a three week period. Um, then I, I think that it would be better to put a currency in the game that is earned through completing a weekly quest. And it requires three tokens to buy the upgrade token that you're looking for. Um, the tokens can be heroic tokens or mythic tokens. And when you spend three of them, you get an item that you then right click and apply to a dinar piece, a faded piece, if you will, to boost it up to being a mythic or heroic piece. The reason why I say this is because that quest to earn those tokens could only require three boss kills or could only require five boss kills, as opposed to requiring a certain amount of boss kills before you are then able to do one of these upgrades. And I say this from a perspective of someone who raids a mythic raid team, where you have a roster of 24, 25 people, and you have 10 bosses in a raid, and you want to rotate those people through and try and get people as many eight bosses as you can to make their vault reward beneficial, which means there's only very few people in the raid who actually get 10 bosses a week, which then puts a group of people, even though they are equal contributors to the raid team, who sit on the bench and are there you know, as support and are in for the bosses they need to be in for, it punishes those players because they aren't in for every single boss. And I think that's unfortunate that that's what the system looks at. Like I, as much as I'm very much a team player, I like to see my, my raid team's item level increase uh, sort of like as a whole and everyone benefits and everyone prospers and that piece of loot goes to the person who it's going to be best for. Like I, I very much am a believer in that. I do think that having a system in the game that makes some players just feel bad, just in general, uh, is just not a great system. Like, I, I, I feel like you, it could easily be designed in a way that goes, you know what, this is supposed to take players three weeks to do, or two weeks to do. Let's make it something that doesn't have a huge, ridiculous threshold to earn completion, but still takes two weeks to do, right? That, to me, achieves the goal you want without applying this really negative feeling to a lot of players. So if the middle vault is five, a five boss kill, make it five boss kills a week. And all of a sudden, now everyone in the roster can get what they need to get out of it. If someone misses a raid night inside some situation, most likely they can still get the majority of that quest completed, if not, not that entire quest completed, um, and not miss their stage, which I think is also really important. So I uh, I, I don't know. I, I think the ciphers could get tweaked in, and be a better overall feel for a lot of players. But uh, I am glad that the system exists because I think it's a great system. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I'm overall, as, as you said, very happy with season four. I think the Faded Experiment is a really good experiment um, to do because it certainly brought out a lot of interesting opinions and interesting thoughts, which we'll get into later in the episode as we hear from our patrons. But uh, for me, Mythic was a big swing and a miss. And not only that, shooting themselves in the foot because they just did it again. They admitted that they'd overtuned things and then they just did it again. I don't understand how they do that, but they did it again. Um, and, uh, and the affixes and rage should just not exist. They should have, they should honestly just remove them. I would be absolutely fine with them putting out a patch note saying we just, we removed the raid affixes. Here's all the raids live as faded with no affixes in them. And I'd be like, okay, we're back. We're doing this. Let's go. 
Um, and they reduced all boss health by 15% across the board because now that there's no affixes. They need to do that. Uh, that, that would be fine with me. So I, uh, I, I would like to see that happen, but yeah. Yeah. I, I want to, I don't want to belabor this too much because we got a lot of patrons to hear from, uh, but I just want to piggyback off of something you were just saying, because one thing that has occurred to me, what well, we both have similar complaints about the faded affix system and the raids. And I, I agree that the tuning overall was a miss just from the jump. Um, it's just, you know, it's easy to out gear heroic quickly. Um, I, won I, I have had the thought and I have wondered like how much of this is related to just the overall level of difficulty, you know, high uh, balance tuning and uh, complexity of Shadowlands rating. And could we see a shift in that in Dragonflight? And does that mean in a world where you have overall more straightforward or less punishing boss mechanics, do something like Faded Ethics has worked better? So maybe, but you know, when you're talking about Denathria, Sylvanas and Jailer, even like Anduin, I, yeah, I don't think they work too great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move into uh, getting our live patrons in here because we have a couple who are hanging out. I'm going to start with Corsair Lock. So I'm going to drag Corsair Lock down here. Evening, Corsair Lock. Are you there? Hey, guys. Hey, there you are. Hey, man. Welcome back. Thank you. Yeah, I just had to uh, turn up my volume. I realized I had it muted. Um, but how are y'all doing? Doing really well. Good, man. Good evening. Yeah. How's uh, how's uh, how's the expansion going for you? Not the expansion, the uh, the season going for you? Well, we just recapped our uh, our feelings on the season, and it's going you know pretty good. I, I have I have my my misses there for what they've done, but. I think overall it's going well. How's it going for you? That's what we want to hear. How are you enjoying it? You know, I appreciate you asking. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm excited about Dragonflight. The whole flying from the beginning thing is a problem that I feel like they've had for quite a while. And I'm really glad they're empowering us to do that. Back in um, my day, we didn't have flying. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> that too. Um, so I'm excited about that. I've been enjoying the nostalgic trip through all these uh, kind of older dungeons. Um, I, I like that idea in general. You know, it's been neat to do that. I, I'm not really sure how people that don't know the dungeons, you know, can actually expect to ramp up on, ramp up on them. But, you know, that's, that's okay, I guess. Um, but, you know, it's fun for me. It's probably fun for you all, too. Um, I've got, a, you know, a few questions for you. Sure, in the context sure. of some in the context of some comments of course um i guess my first question is uh you know how did y'all feel about the timing of the transition from season three to season four um you know the raid uh, you know Sylvanas, not Sylvanas. uh you know the raid we didn't have like in our raid we didn't have it on farm for that long yeah um so in that sense it felt a little rushed to me also i was um really in a nice spot with my tunes you know they were some of them were just very well geared and were just a lot of fun to play um i was knocking out 20s on my i got the 20s done on my warrior and then i switched over to doing them on my warlock and i managed to get those both done um but then you know i would have enjoyed doing it with my tank and maybe a healer too it just kind of ran out of time and uh you know, so even even without a steady push group, I was still enjoying it. But then, you know, like increasing the level cap is kind of like a necessary evil in some sense. Um, but from my perspective, they kind of ruined the game a little bit for me. And I was kind of curious, uh, yeah. kind of curious what you all felt there. Well, so, I mean, I, I, I can sympathize uh, and I certainly express this on, on our show with the feeling that you were just kind of settling into your farm routine and yeah. that they sort of stole that away from you, right? <laughs> that basically you you had this opportunity to do something that uh, was really fun, um, where you kind of relax and do like a two two night a week or a one night a week clear, yeah, uh, and, and, and and have the the rest of the week as time that you spend as you talked about pushing keys or unlocking or getting stuff done, um, and that's sort of what season three has always been about is like wrapping up all of your goals and taking it easy and getting that nice break before the big leveling push and everything else happens with the expansion. So I can, I can sympathize with you there. And I guess, um, 
that was the most felt for me in raid uh because mm. it we basically like we even had a conversation with our officers where they expressed hey we're only going to go go back to a, a three night maybe a two night a week schedule as far as what we're looking at doing content wise outside of that we're not going to be doing anything and then when faded came out that the the uh sentiment they'd expressed was based upon Faded being the victory lap that we all had sort of thought and hoped that it would be. <laughs> and when they realized that it was actually a challenge, suddenly that, you know, raid schedule expanded back out again for the oh, first couple it. of weeks. Huh. Um, and so that kind of became stolen time from something that we were all expecting to have, uh, which yeah. was unfortunate. So uh, I, I certainly felt that. And now obviously we've, we've sort of shifted the mentality back over to, you know what? We just don't care if we don't clear the raid because the majority of people just don't <laughs> want to be here doing it. Um, yeah. And so that's the uh, that that's an unfortunate uh, consequence of Blizzard's decision on what they're doing with the mythic level content. Um, as far as mythic plus goes for this season, I'm thrilled with it. You know, I, I really enjoy it. I think that they uh, have done a really good job rotating those dungeons out and rotating in new dungeons. I, I will say that. Um, we had a lot of time in season three to sort of earn those twenties and get there at least on mm -hmm. the one character. I feel like a second character. Yes. If you're trying to push and, and do that on a second character, I can see that the time was getting pretty tight. Um, BFA had the worst transitions between one raid tier and one season and the next. Uh, some of them were really, really tight. Um, especially, you know, Jaina to Unot, Unot to, um, uh, whatever the, the, what, what was the city called again? The last raid tier. Desar Desar or no, no. Nihilotha. Nihilotha. The last Thank one. You. Yeah. It's, it's like starts with yeah. an N. Um, Nihilotha, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, was really, really quick. Um, but I'm, I'm, I wasn't even thinking of Nihilotha. I was thinking of the underwater one. Cause that's what we actually went to. Yeah. Went to, yeah. You're thinking right. of Eternal Palace. Yeah. Eternal that was Palace. Jaina yeah. into Unot a crucible into, into yeah. Eternal Palace, Palace was, was like back to back to back to back. Yeah, uh, and for us it was progression the whole time. Like we killed Jaina the next week, we went and started fighting mm -hmm. Unot, and we killed Unot, and the next week we went and started fighting Eternal Palace, and it was there was no downtime and no farm for us uh, between those raid tiers, and that so really this is a pattern. Well, I mean, it's that that was in, in my opinion just a bad production schedule, and I think um, season four is something they're squeezing in, right? They're shoehorning this into the end of this expansion. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that they find time to do something like this because they need the experiments, right? So as much as mm -hmm. I regret that I sort of lost the casual, really relaxed one night a week raid or two night a week raid uh, time, the rest of the time off for two and a half or three months, you know, to sort of do whatever I want that period of time, um, I do feel like you need to look at season four as more of they're just giving you the option to do something else. And I think people are starting to come to that realization. It feels like my raid team's starting to come to that realization of we don't have to clear this every week. We could just go and kill Jailer every week and get someone their mount. And then we could, you know, do whatever we wanted to do with the rest of that time, even if that means just not clearing the raid. Uh, it's just yeah. so ingrown into so many raiders of every week you clear the raid, you get as much loot as possible and you move on to the next thing and get as much loot as possible, power up your character as much as possible. Um, I feel like if this can shift some of that mentality around to, no, you know what? It's okay that you don't clear the raid every week because we're going to replace all this gear in two and a half or three months anyways. Right. So I mean, they're, you know. they're already going to kill it, right? Yeah, like, exactly. it, I feel like there's an investment in the characters, but by, but, and they've, they have accelerated the ramp up. Right. Yeah. But like going, I, I was kind of destroyed a little bit inside by the reset at the end of season three and i realized i'm not gonna be able to play all of my alts this week yeah all this 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 season yeah. like if i try to do that i'm just setting myself up for the same set of feelings right yeah and yeah so uh <laughs> that hurts yeah jason you want to add yeah. to this yeah i mean i think i think season three was definitely just way too short it only ended up being five months long um and it was the most bosses and hardest bosses of the right. entire expansion, right? So it's just, I think the thing is, it once they sort of started dialing in where Dragonflight was going to land, which as of right now, we still don't know when that is, but, you know, I went, oh, this is a month too early at least for this season. 
this is I don't like this. But then I went, well, that must mean that Dragonflight's coming out earlier than I thought it was. Yeah, because mm-hmm. I, I was think, I, you know, I was cynically kind of thinking like, well, they must be they must be penciling Dragonflight in for you know Q one. 23 regardless of what they're saying but there's no reason to do the season roll in august you know early august if they were planning on having it come out that that far out so i mean in my case it didn't feel that bad i would have liked to have more time to just kind of farm a heroic sepulcher i guess except the bosses that are a problem in that raid became such a headache to reclear on a weekly basis that maybe that wouldn't have been fun anyway um, I, I'm a bit privileged because I had all my portals done for this expansion in season two. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I guess not all of them, right? Cause I had to do Taz of Ash. You couldn't do that in season two, but all I needed in season three was Taz of Ash, which I did. And it's like, okay, bring on the new mythic plus stuff. I'm ready. I want to get the new portals. If I can, I want to, you know, yeah. gear back up, but you know, that stuff was working against so like, eh, I'd really like to have like at least another month to kind of just farm sepulcher and, and chill. But you know, at least at the heroic level, the, you know, it was a little bit rocky the first couple weeks, but like last week was a breeze, and this this past week in Nathria, other than Denathrius, was very easy. So, I think like a team like mine is set up pretty well to just hang out and kill this stuff, collect Mog, collect you know those that particular build and mm-hmm. put it together the way you want it to be, and that should be pretty fun. And if we get out of this expansion in another, you know, three months or something here, then I you know I think it I think in the end it all worked out pretty well. Um, but yeah, it was it was a bit whiplashy, right? Like ideally, you probably would have had season two start a little bit earlier than it did last year, which then would have pushed all this stuff a little bit earlier, mm-hmm. right? We would, maybe would have gotten, you know, season three in like January, February or something, and and get a whole other month, month and a half out of there, and and then that would line up everything like perfectly. Um, nothing, nothing is perfect, and you know, game development is hard for sure. <laughs> um, and you know, at the end of the day the game like kind of lives and dies off of expansion releases, especially when there are, you know, downturns like we've seen throughout Shadowlands. It's like, well, the only way to really juice the player base back up is to get something new out. So, you know, you know, they've been put, I'm I'm sure they've been putting as many resources as they can into getting Dragonflight out the door. And that just means that you can't, you know, they're not going to let Shadowlands content breathe for the sake of it breathing. They're going to just try to keep it as engaging as possible for the people that are still logging in all the time and try to get Dragonflight out the door. So, yeah, ideally I would have liked another month at least on season three. But now that we're out the other side, I, it doesn't even matter to me. I'm just, I'm enjoying what we're playing. I'm just ready for the next thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, kind of feels, it kind of feels like they're trying to get back to a, you know, Thanksgiving release date. And as a yeah, result, something like that. And then they've, you know, kind of accelerated this one. So maybe the next set, maybe that'll be a two years thing again. Um, yeah, maybe maybe it'll work out. I'm gonna assume you mean um, U.S. Thanksgiving is what I'm gonna assume. That is what I mean. Yes, Thank you for that clarification. Um, yeah. So I guess my next comment, Spencer, you you kind of men- mentioned it as on your know, raid difficulty tuning. And Jason, as I thought about this, I kind of had you in my head, and I could imagine you saying, "Never in the history of WoW has someone said." I wish I could go refrog that boss. And, um, you know, yeah, I, I, <laughs> um, I, I feel like these bosses, they should really just be loop pinatas at the difficulty that yep. we'd already cleared them. Right. So like I want to go in and get heroic, I mean, mythic gear, then yeah, there's probably something I need to learn, but given we already cleared on heroic, you know, many times it really should just be falling over. And, so my question for y'all is, are people in your raids enjoying the reprog? Um, and how's it working out when you've got new people that don't know the fights? Um, yeah. Uh, well, from my perspective, um, whenever you have someone who's new and in a mythic raid, you expect them to entirely mess up in, in, on the first time they're seeing a boss and at least <laughs> the first five times on some bosses. Jailer's a great example. Even even non-faded Jailer right now, bringing in new people can cause an hour, an hour and a half of wipes because they just need time to see the fight, see the movement, learn the dance, learn what they need to do. 
So if, mm-hmm. if you're bringing in more than one person, which I mean, you can easily kill Mythic Jailer with one person dead, uh, then you know you're you're in a situation where as those people learn how to do it, they're going to struggle with it. Adding affixes in on top of that with faded content that requires you to use them properly to kill some of these bosses uh, is a lot for a lot of individuals to actually be able to deal with. Um, and makes it progression is what it makes it right. It makes it a relearning experience, which is what, as you just described, this in my opinion should not have been. Uh, it shouldn't have been a situation where people had to reprogress these fights to be able to kill them. And I don't think the affixes should have been something that you had to use at least me- you know at, at a medium level of uh, of success to be able to defeat these bosses well. Uh, I just I feel like overall it's there's there's a lot of misses with season four in the rating scene and a lot of it comes down to um, the affixes that were added and how they chose to do the tuning. Now, I do think uh, to answer the other part of this question, there are a lot of raid teams out there who are still you know anxious and excited to to kill these bosses and get loot. My raid team in particular, I was just describing this earlier in the episode, uh, just voted not to raid past a certain point. Like we just you know uh, yeah. we we went and cleared. Um, up until Stone Legion Generals and went and got people their Jailer mounts uh, off non-faded Jailer and then did a vote for if people wanted to go back and finish Stone Legion Generals and get Denathrius and the majority of our team said no. And you're like, all right, well, that that to me is literally taking a poll of Mythic Raiders of who actually wants to put effort into doing this. And we got our answer, which was not a lot of people enjoy this content. Not a lot of people are enjoying smashing their face against a boss um, that they killed in progression a while ago and now is back tuned up with a- affixes. Like that's just not something that they're interested in doing. So uh, I-, I think that's unfortunate. Um, I- I've been saying it time and time again on the episode, teams that were clearing through the most recent mythic content, the Jailer mythic content, should have been able to clear through all of these raids as they came back in the same period of time um, inside their raid week. If you were able to clear the the you know sepulcher raid uh then you should have been able to clear whatever other raid was coming back in their three-week rotation uh the week that it was out inside you know at least the same raid schedule and i think it's unreasonable that they release content that required players to progress so much that that wasn't happening and it's so clear in the amount of kills when you go and check raider.io and you start looking at you know what how many teams have killed these bosses and how many teams were killing jailer before this Mm-hmm. on a regular basis it's pretty shocking to see like f- less than 10 percent, less than five percent some cases less than three percent were killing some of these bosses and you're like that's not good design that's just a, a straight up <laughs> you know imbalanced bad setup hmm. yeah i mean in our case it really hasn't felt like reprog honestly um we we haven't we haven't gone a week where we didn't full clear the heroic raid that was faded um including the first week and including last week, which was really dicey with creation spark with, uh, on jailer for us. Um, I didn't think we were going to be able to, in fact, I sort of bet on the fact that we weren't going to be able to, and then we did anyway, but for the most part, you know, the first week was like, okay, how do these bosses work again? What do these affixes mm-hmm. do? Okay. We'll figure it out. Second week was like, okay, fate scribe sucks. Ilana sucks. Okay. And then, uh, you know, last week for sepulcher was like, it felt great. It didn't really feel that much different than doing heroic and, and the affix has kind of at least added some extra oomph. And plus by that point we had two full weeks of gear. And then this week, everything in Nathria kind of fell over except for Denathria. So, mm-hmm. you know, we got a little attendance bump. People are a little bit more interested and motivated than um, they have. They had been at the end of season three, for example. Um, you know, we, we have a couple new faces here and there. We have one guy who's really under experienced and, um, he spends a lot of time dead. I, I'm not sure that he's really improving, but it's hard to assess because the bosses are dying so fast. It's like, what are you really going to learn yeah. when you do a mechanic wrong and then 21 other people blow up a boss in three minutes flat and you move on to the next thing? Like, I, you know, it, it's it's hard when you're not progging alongside everybody else. And mm-hmm. there's just there's nothing about this season that I would say for our team feels like prog in any way. Like. There are times when a certain affix means, okay, we have to adjust a strat. We have to think about this in a different way. We need to pay attention to the affix mechanic very specifically in this instance. But that feels like solving a puzzle in a bit of a different way to the to the extent of like, maybe you have some kind of cheese strat or something you do on a boss and 
the person who uses the immunity for it was, you know, absent that night because I had something going on or whatever, or, you know, you had people leave the, the raid team and you, you didn't backfill them with the same specs or whatever. It's just like, okay, when this timing happens, do this. It's obnoxious. It doesn't really feel uh, rewarding or fun to work around, but that's been the extent of like the frustration with it. And I think it's going to be a lot smoother sailing through the rest of this process as people really start hitting those, you know, gear plateaus and they keep mm-hmm. nerfing stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. I, overall, it's really hard to gauge when you're in, if this feels just like deep farm to me for the most part, and it's hard to yeah. gauge like how new people are catching on because they just don't have an opportunity. You know, they don't, nothing is really expected of them except to maybe try to contribute some damage or, or whatever. So yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to gauge, but it hasn't, in fact, I also had somebody come back this week to raid who hasn't played since I don't know season two, maybe at the at the most recent, and he did he did fine. Like he's he's behind on stuff, but he knows he's he knows the mechanics okay, and you know he wasn't super lost. So it's it's cool it's cool to have at least people interested in doing the raids, and it's a it's yeah. a cool format. Like I, I think for heroic, it's it's fine. Like the really high performers are so optimized and geared out at this point that like they can carry a lot of other people. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad it's working out on your raid. Um, that's good. I'm glad to hear. Yeah, that. I, I was I I was a little bit afraid that it wasn't going to, but it's been fine. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, do you have I, another question my, going? Yeah, mm-hmm. my next my next question is on the dinar, and this is a little bit more of a kind of. There's a little bit of a thought experiment here. Um, I think it's interesting. Um, but I wish that it resulted in 304 loot. Basically, anything that's not, you know, with the exception of maybe like Old Warrior's Soul or something like that, you know, uh, if it's not 304, well, then that means it's going to be at the heroic level. And that ends up being, you know, maybe not as useful, right? Relative to the gear that you get out of the vault and, um, you know, Mythic Plus. So this and is a- I was- Go ahead. Sorry. I was kind of curious, you know, what would have been the harm, particularly with this experimental season, in making it drop three or four loot instead, you know, not drop, but, you know, achieve three or four loot. And then really the only reason I can think of that they wouldn't be doing that is that this is a system that they want to use in the future and that this is really close to where they would expect to use it in the long term. And so maybe they're just, they literally are just play testing it. Well, yeah. Um, so, so that's that's the first part for sure. You you hit that part of they're one hundred percent not just testing the dinar, they're testing ciphers, right? That that two different systems, the ciphers killing mythic bosses gives you the opportunity to upgrade those normal pieces or any faded piece to be in a, that three hundred four or that you know three eleven piece uh, is is a system that they're testing. The dinar is another system that they're testing of giving players the opportunity to buy those trinkets or weapons that are critical pieces for you to actually feel powerful on your character. I'll emphasize that the difference between a heroic trinket and a mythic trinket is very insignificant. It's a, it's a literal, very, very small step between that heroic piece and that mythic piece when it comes to trinkets. Uh, similarly with rings rings. It's another case where like the step between uh, a heroic and a mythic ring is a very small step. And you've seen this inside mythic plus where, you know, as you upgrade your ring, if you've ever seen how much of a DPS gain or how much of a healing gain is bumping my ring up by, you know, nine or 12 item levels, it's incredibly small. It's it's such a small sort of shift. Um, the trinkets are similar that way. Sure, you're going to gain maybe a, you know, going from heroic to mythic, you might gain a five to 6% in- increase or improvement on that item. That's really about it. That's all you're really gaining. So... Uh, I wouldn't stress too much over those things not being 304 coming out of, you know, your your uh, dinars that you get for free. Um, weapons, obviously, totally different side of the coin. Uh, having a weapon like uh, on Tumbra, for example, at Heroic versus, you know, having one at Mythic is a fairly substantial DPS increase or, or power increase for your character. Mm-hmm. Um, so those pieces... Uh, I can see a little bit more of an argument towards, hey, it would have been nice if these just came out straight as the highest item level they were, because otherwise I might buy this piece, I get it on normal, until I kill enough heroic bosses, I'm actually using a totally different piece of gear from Mythic Plus, and even once I can upgrade this to heroic, 
you know, I got this thing from my vault that's a Mythic Plus piece that's still better than it uh, until I can actually run enough Mythic bosses to be able to bump this thing up to being Mythic. Um, and so there's a little bit more of a weird situation there, but mm -hmm. it's an experimental season, right? They're using this as a test case. Uh, there's a reason why they chose weapons and trinkets because those tend to be the most impactful thing. Not having a trinket, um, even not having a normal version of a trinket versus having that normal version that is a really good trinket for you is a huge character performance increase. It's massive, mm -hmm. right? So I, I think the trinkets it makes a ton of sense for with Dinar, even with the upgrade system for ciphers. I think weapons, uh, everyone wants the highest, best weapon they could possibly get. Um, but if you're running heroic content, honestly, just be able to buy a weapon off of Rigalon or off of, you know, Sardanathrius or whatever it is with a Dinar is hugely powerful for your character. Um, and you, you'll, you literally won't be able to upgrade it inside of the content that you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. if you're off to do mythic content afterwards, then you're going to be earning boss kills towards upgrading that to be in a mythic piece. And you'll probably get the boss kills to upgrade it before you kill that boss, given the current yeah. difficulty of mythic raids. So, uh, it's, it's something that I, I, I think the systems are pretty successful. I don't have an issue with the way they implemented them. And yeah, as a test case, I think they're being fairly successful. Yeah, I mean, it's good that they they work with ciphers, right? That's that's the key element there. Uh, you, I don't I don't think you should be able to earn a three hundred four item level piece from killing thirty normal raid bosses. Yeah, I just don't. I don't. I don't. I don't, I don't think the reward is commensurate with the effort there. Um, you know, the good thing is, of course, if you're just doing mythic anyway to to do your your dinar quest, then you can you already have enough ciphers to upgrade it by the time you get that first item, right? So. I think it's good, and I, I don't really see them ever doing a system where, like, normal raid bosses, you know, routinely, repeatedly award you directly with a mythic item level piece of your choosing. Um, you know, maybe they could do, like, specific coins for each difficulty, but I don't like that degree of complexity. I like the flexibility of the system better than, you know, oh, you have to get... 30 normal kills for a, a 278 piece or, you know, 30 mythic kills for a 304 piece. And there, you know, there's nothing in between. You just get what you get. Like this way, if you, if you're not, if you miss some bosses for your team's clear or whatever, you can make it up in other difficulties. You can do LFR, you can pug, whatever. And you're still working towards the same item. So I don't know. I, I don't, I don't really think they should do anything massively different with the way Dinar specifically works. I do think they should probably bring it back for season one Dragonflight. And um, yeah, it's, I, I think, you know, you could look at the timings probably, and I wouldn't be surprised if maybe they make it, you know, your first one is maybe a little bit later than week three, right? Yeah. It just kind of move that timeline out a little bit. But I think keep the system accessible and flexible and then make, you know, if you want to get that, that higher item level reward, then, you know, do the higher level content and then apply the item. I, I think that works fine. Yeah. I think that's all reasonable. Um, yeah. Cool. So I guess my last question for you is what's your favorite dungeon in the current mythic plus rotation and, uh, you know, a quick why on that. Uh, is, is junkyard too much? I was going to say, is that fi <laughs> favorite, favorite dungeon to push really, really high junkyard favorite dungeon to run and have fun running with people. That's a tough one. Um, of all of these dungeons, which one do I, I think? Find? Let me, let me go. go what ahead, do you, you think? Ahead, I, yeah, I sure. mean, yeah, I, I would put Junkyard up on my list, not just cause it's easy, but because I like how it has a little bit of built in variety that feels fair, right? Like each week you, there's kind of maybe a different path you want to go, but also the bots add a lot of decision-making to how you approach mm -hmm. your route and they feel really good to have. Like the bonuses are so big. Yeah. Uh, so Junkyard is just fun to do. Everybody wants to do it because you get you get those cool powers and you just feel awesome running around in there. Yeah. Uh, for just like overall flavor and and for design, I, I think I've been having the most fun in Salia's Gambit. I mean, that's that was what uh, my answer was going to be. That's what yeah, I was all I, I was thinking. His ga Gambit to me is my favorite <laughs> Mythic Plus dungeon mm -hmm. in years. Yeah, I, I I like the kind of the variety of the vibes between the you know the Murloc. Area and then you go down into the vault and then you come out into the pirate cove and then you're in you know Tazavesh mm -hmm. land. 
And uh, yeah, I, I like the layout. You again, you have a lot of flexibility up front. I mean, there's kind of a standard route that you know for season four, but it feels good to do. And I think the dungeon presents fun, interesting, you know, interactive challenges depending on whether it's Fort versus Tyrannical Week. Uh, and I think the bosses are pretty fun. Se- the second boss is uh, is a really fun boss to tank once you start getting the hang of it. I dreaded it at yeah. first when it came out in in season three, but. Um, it's really a place for a tank to kind of show off their skill and be able to really control the positioning and, mm-hmm. and, you know, keep everything clear for their teammates. So that's really fun. And, uh, the last boss requires a lot of teamwork. It's, I, I think it's really, uh, tuned well right now. Like it, it just feels good to do it. I mean, junkyard is definitely the, the easiest dungeon to blast through and try to push high and, you know, two chests and just do all kinds of wacky stuff in. But in terms of like my actual taste and play style, I think Gambit is my favorite in the pool. Yep, agreed. I think Gambit is uh, a phenomenal M plus dungeon. I think the boss design is fantastic. I really enjoy the mechanics that they put in. They feel good. Uh, they don't feel extraordinarily punishing on any particular role or class, and it's great. It's just good design. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, th- those are both great. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, well thank you guys. again. It's great thanks, to man. hear from you. You have yourself a good rest of your evening. And you uh, too. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Take All right, man. Thanks for checking in, man. Take it easy. Okay. Uh, before we move forward, Jason, do you mind just dropping and reconnecting again? Because you've gotten some roboting going on. Let me do that. Thanks. Is that better? Let's see. I guess I should turn my camera on. Yep. You were showing up as a probe for me on my screen. There we go. Oh, weird. Yep. Well, that's because I have one on my shelf. So my shelf moved over into your camera frame. Oh, was, I see. It was hilarious. All right. Anyways. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that is much better. Perfect. Uh, let's move on to uh, our patron responses. So in response to our question, this comes in from Excess Beans, which is a great you know, handle anyways. Uh, it says, it was pretty rough at first, but at, as my first guild got geared and got used to doing Castle Nathria and Sanctum of Doodoo again... Uh, we are doing a lot better. Last night, we were three bosses from full clearing Castle Nathria in just two hours. So we're probably going to move on to Heroic, which is super exciting. Uh, we're a brand new guild uh, with new raiders, and it's awesome to see our group succeed and grow together. That is always a good feeling. I'm so glad that you guys feel like you're being successful, meeting your goals, and trying out something new. That always progressing feels great. So good for you. It's one of the best things you could do in this game, I think. Yeah, agreed. Really? Yeah. Uh, the question for us is that the Starting Zones community has become quite the helpful and knowledgeable group. What are some of your favorite parts about the podcast community and reach? Uh, as our response here says, I like asking wholesome questions to break up the standard questions. Well, I agree that wholesome questions are always great. We have another one a little bit later in the show that I noticed someone had asked. Uh, I try not to read too many of these ahead of time because getting that first impressions important well um man when i some of my favorite parts of the podcast community group i think one of my favorite parts is when someone asks a question in our discord often someone else has answered that question in a helpful and knowledgeable way before i even get to look at it um i love that people are not afraid to jump in in a respectful and friendly way and lend a hand to someone who's asking a question about how to do something or where something is, or they don't quite understand something. Um, I, I always uh, worry that I'm not, um, I, I guess what, gardening or, or tending to our Discord enough, like not being uh, a helicopter view over what's happening at all of the time, uh, because I don't want someone's question or, or whatnot to go unanswered for too long or for someone to be waiting and need something and us not... Uh, have noticed it or seen it or whatever it is, it got lost in the shuffle. Um, so it's great when our community members just hop in and and not not just help, but often start up interesting conversations, sometimes form groups together and, and participate in activities together. Like that's definitely my favorite part of our community. Yeah, I would, I would, I would say mine, it's kind of similar to what you said, or maybe it's an outgrowth of that. But, you know, the show, obviously we do, uh, sometimes we, encounter new players, returning players, people who haven't played in 10, 15 years, people who've never played before or never played with any seriousness before. And, um, you know, they might pop into 
the discord or something with, you know, questions about how do I, as someone who doesn't know anything about what's happening, get involved in any of this. And, uh, I feel like the people that hang out in, in our circles are very welcoming and encouraging to, you know, newer or returning players that have like a lot of, a lot of hurdles, right? Like a lot of, a lot of goals that they need to start reaching. And that's awesome. I think that's a very important thing for the game as it becomes older and older, right? It becomes more of this like generational game almost. And and this thing that people kind of rotate in and out of over time, um, having those connections in a place to be like, Hey, I, I, I'm having fun, but I don't understand this element or like, I want to get more serious, but I don't know where to begin. And having outlets for that is really important. And I think we've done a good job of, you know, uh, fostering discussion among people with that kind of mindset where they can talk about it. It's not all about just like, Oh, check out my, you know, check out my IO score or whatever. Like, I mean, I, we get into that stuff too, because it's, it's fun to see people like meet those goals and get what they want out of the experience and exhibit skill and whatever. But you know, um, there, there are all kinds of different ways to play and enjoy wow and, and helping people find that. I mean, I think that's a big mission of the show in general, right. Is to find stuff that's fun about wow. And, and, you know, kind of relate to people based on that stuff and maybe even suggest some stuff to check out. So I, I think, you know, the show probably attracts people who also have those kind of thoughts. And, and so, yeah, it's, it's awesome when, you know, a new listener pops in and, and needs some advice about how to, and how to get the most out of wow. And, and people hop in there and offer suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to do another pause because you're doing the robot thing again. I'm just going to call you the way we normally do. So if you just want to okay. pop out and then right. I'll, uh, I'll give you a ring. All right, folks, just give us one moment. This the normal way. Yeah, that was not a good experience. Discord, thank you. All right. Do, do. And we'll get you. Hi. Back up. Hello. Oh, my goodness, you sound better. Okay. Let's just. Okay. Something about that proper. room, maybe. Maybe. Just gonna read yeah, it's just, dis- just hashtag just Discord things. Uh, definitely just Discord things. Well, the the other thing about that is that I don't know if that server was currently set to West Coast, which is possible. Right. And that creates issues. Oh, you're still pixelating a bit here, but you still sound mm. good. So. I wonder if my upstream is messed up. Something like that. No, nah, my upstream is normal. I don't know, man. It's just know. internet things. Whatever. Anyways, it's, we can the, move it's on. the cloud. Yeah. Okay. Next question comes in from Desk Pop, uh, who has the reply to us, which is Season four is fine. The fixes are terrible and are for no reason just a pain in the butt. Uh, personally, I wish the dinar system was lowered to be able to grab some high priority items easier. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, for you, gents, what do you think should be changed for balancing going forward? As a primary affliction main, it was nuked to the ground in season two, and Destro the same uh, coming into this season. I find it frustrating and it seems to be tuned strictly for the mythic slash very high end key type players. And the rest of us are just left hanging. Uh, it was almost like we couldn't figure out how to balance. So nuke it. Um, okay. So this is a tricky thing because you're a warlock player and the world I live in. And I have to just remember that this is the world I live in, which is the mythic rating scene. Warlocks are extremely broken at the moment when it comes to damage and what they can do, which is why they're making these adjustments. An example for this, uh, on a fight um, like Skolex, a warlock currently is doubling, literally doubling the damage and DPS done than a, a balanced druid. It is literally doubling the damage that they can do. The, the best balanced druid in the world is doing half the damage of the best top 100 warlocks in the world. That is very telling in where balance currently lies with the class. Now, what you're referring to, to me, also references the skill cap of a class and that that sort of bell curve that exists in that class. In order for those players who are playing warlock to do what I'm describing them being able to do, they have to be very, very, very good warlocks who are able to sort of game the system to a certain degree to be able to accomplish that. And the fact that, 
<laughs> the fact that you aren't able to do that says that there's probably some learning curve there that's a little bit challenging to be able to accomplish that goal. Um, so I'm not saying that uh, it does. It isn't unfortunate for you that your class received, you know, balancing that made you do less damage. Uh, that's not fun at all. Um, but it is one of those tricky situations because it actually up until last season, the top three DPS specs in the game were all Warlock specs, uh, which is a very weird thing to have ever experienced in an expansion. Um, so uh, I guess for me, um, I think as far as balancing goes going forward, I would like to see no class in particular be more than 8% or 10% higher in, in, you know, variation from the lowest class. So the best DPS class in the game shouldn't be able to do more than 10% more damage than the worst DPS class in the game would be my ideal for balancing. Um, the issue is they like saying, Hey, you know what, if you're really good at this, then you should be able to do these really tricky things to sort of game the, the, the mechanics of the game to do some pretty extreme damage. And they, they like that that creates some pretty interesting things for classes. Um, and I don't know if they're going to want to get rid of that skill cap uh, that exists right now. Um, Druid was in a similar situation with Balanced Druid and Venthyr Druid, where being able to play Venthyr was something that was quote-unquote very easy to do. However, the difference between someone who played Venthyr very well and someone who uh, doesn't play Venthyr Druid very well is a pretty extreme damage difference. Because what you do in that 20 to 30 second window and how you cast and how you make the decisions about what you're casting was really, really important for your damage profile. Um, so that, you know, was, was one of those things where that skill cap is a large factor. So uh, I, I think when it comes to balancing, they need to do balancing more frequently because that's the only way you're going to get that, you know, 8 to 10% variance between the best and the worst DPS spec. I'd much rather people brought classes to, the, to a fight um, who are strong in a certain area as opposed to classes to a fight who are just strong everywhere all of the time and you have to bring them. One thing I think on this topic, I mean, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't really have much to add to, to what you said, but I think one problem here is, or at least up to this point, especially in Shadowlands, there are so many knobs to tune, right? With, between covenant choices, conduits, legendaries, all of that stuff. Um, and all that stuff, to some degree or another, requires player investment, right? If you need to switch a legendary, well, you got to go get that. You either got to spend a bunch of gold to buy it, you got to skill up to make it, you got to find somebody to make it for you for mats or whatever. Um, you know, in the past, we've had like the AP problem where it's like, okay, I need to switch specs and then my AP doesn't carry over or. Like uh, we had the Azerite armor problem where it's like, oh, this trait's actually not very good or it, something changed and it's not good anymore and I want these traits instead, but I have to go reacquire them. And, you know, um, we don't have this level of complexity on top of Dragonflight classes, at least not that we know of at the moment. So it could be possible that tuning is a bit easier because there are lower player impacts, right? If they nerf a overperforming talent and buff an underperforming talent for a spec all that spec needs to do is take the other talent when they log in next right there's there, there's no like i have to grind this up in order to take advantage of this new build so i'm hoping that kind of streamlining this stuff and, and putting it putting more of the power like back intrinsically in your character and in your class spec trees might mean that this stuff is mitigated a bit, right? Because you can you can make more frequent changes because it just benefits players, you know, a, across the board. It doesn't. It's not a, a a burden that you're putting on players to now catch up to the point where you can take advantage of the new build. Yeah, I I, I mean I've talked about this at, at length on our podcast over this expansion, but just having too many dials to turn when it comes to soulbinds, conduits, legendaries, covenants. Uh, like just so many different dials to turn um, creates a lot of issues with this game as far as balance goes. Because inevitably there's going to be something where it's like, well, if you're playing this particular spec or you're playing this class with this spec, with this covenant, with this legendary, with this trinket, with this set of conduits chosen, 
uh, at this light uh, level and you've stacked haste, then you do this incredibly broken thing. And you're like, yeah, but how many people can do that, right? And you're like, well, at least 200, and those are the top 200 people in the world who can do it. So we're right. going to nerf this thing about this class. And everyone who's not doing that now does less damage and it feels bad for them. But we had to nerf it because of what these particular people were doing. And this is the best way we could figure out to resolve this incredibly broken thing they were doing. And you're like, that feels bad for a lot of people because of, you know, as, as you sort of put it um, in, in this uh, desktop is nerfing, nerfing things or, or tuning things for the mythic slash very high end key runners. Right. Um, and that's, that's what it feels like. Cause those are the people who try to find ways to break the game all the time and, and do things that they shouldn't be able to do with their class. Uh, so of course they're nerfing it because of what those people have done. Um, even if you weren't someone who was taking advantage of it. I mean, I, I remember seeing Rigolon numbers from our warlocks when we were doing progression where they were just getting an insane amount of imps out and just like popping off and blowing everyone else's DPS out of the water. And it being like, wow, whatever you're doing is something that I think Blizzard's going to address at some point down the line because that can't be right. <laughs> and it was like, all right, it wasn't an easy thing to do. They had to, to you know, play their spec very, very well. And it was a niche situation for that boss and et cetera, et cetera. But it, you know, needed to get addressed and that just made the game less fun for people who weren't doing it. So, yeah. It's a yeah, and when you have the, those all those layers of complexity stacked on top of each other, that presents the opportunity for these edge cases like you're yeah. talking about. It's it's hard to foresee them as much because there are so many variables. So, I, I mean, that's one of my big hopes, I think, for kind of the, the restructuring of how we approach this stuff in Dragonflight is that, you know, the fact that everything comes from just your choice of class and spec and your talent build – That'll, it'll make things more flexible and more balanceable. I think there yeah. might be situations now where they feel like they can't balance things maybe to the degree they want to because it puts too much of a burden on players. Well, and the, the thought of if you change a Soulbind's ability, if you nerf it in some way, does that then affect all of these other classes and all these other specs who use that Soulbind, right? Like you right. can't, you can't then, play with yeah. these systems too much without messing up everybody who uses the system. So. Right. And, uh, you know, even if you do that, like, well, what if what if that means that, uh, I don't know, a soulbind is, is so overperforming that then a different covenant soulbind is actually better for a particular spec. Right. And then you got to go level that up and renown it up. And uh, let's well, just, I, yeah. And then and then because they've now, you know, had enough eyes on this other way of doing things, they find a broken way to do that over there. Right. And then right. what do you yeah. do with that? One? I guess <laughs> that just, is that is the whack-a-mole yeah. problem that is game design sometimes. Like I think it's cool to have post max level progression systems, but this stuff like this is why I'm good with them going away for a while. Right. You know, let's let's get let's get back to basics and and kind of see what is what is fun about like just a traditional WoW setup in a modern context. Yeah. All right. Next one comes in from Elianus, who says thoughts on season four as a casual tank slash healer, only pugging around four mythic plus dungeons a week. Uh, think most of think most of changes in season four were great. Glad I don't have to grind Torghast anymore. Um, well, unless you have alts and you want to get some currency, unless you have a lot on your main and you can mail it around, which I think was a nice change as well. Um, though an item level upgrade on existing legendaries would have been nice. I agree. I think it feels really weird to be moving all of my legendaries onto bracers or, well, move my unity onto bracers and move my other legendaries around onto boots or things like that because they're lower stat priority pieces, which means them being lower item level is less impactful than like your helm being a lower item level uh, than other pieces. That felt really strange to do that, but that was the optimal slash efficient way to do it. Um, so yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I just wish season three was longer. Uh, I was, as I was still getting used to ha hanging to, huh, as I was still getting the hang of routes uh, with Mythic Plus, uh, it's a lot of having to learn six new dungeons, new trash mechanics and bosses and having to do it in a shorter season without having played normal or heroic uh, versions. Still hoping to get K Keystone Master, but might be out of my reach. That being said, like the dungeon, I like the dungeon pool. They are fun. Having no Valor cap and double the amount of Cosmic Flux is pretty great. Hope Dragonflight comes soon. Really want to get back to doing things on Azeroth while we can all reflect and agree on that part of that. Um, I haven't yeah. heard too much sentiment that's like, man, why do we have to go back to Azeroth next expansion? I, oh, I haven't yeah. heard anybody say that no yet. I mean, that. I, I'm sure somebody out there feels that way, but they haven't said it to me. Yeah. A uh, question for us is, been listening to a lot of older episodes, and on episode 423, 
the end of VFA, you talked about how expansions uh, with a clear big bad guy usually had better launches than ones without. Who do you think is going to be the big bad for Dragonflight? And do you think they will reveal it before launch? Uh, yeah, I, they haven't revealed who the ultra big bad is um, for this expansion yet. It is still very much a Pandaria launch where they go, here's something really cool and exciting. Dragons are back. Just like, hey, look, it's pandas, as, a, as an example, um, without actually giving us a, here's the looming threat. Uh, that's going on. And I do miss those expansions. I miss the expansions where it was like Arthas, Illidan, like here are the clear big enemies, you know, uh, that we are going to be having. Um, but yeah, I, I feel like we're going to obviously have something either very elemental related or very dragon related um, as a big bad, uh, whether it's a, a, dra a, a particular dragon flight that has also awoken along with these other dragons that um, is Descent, whether they do like a Nora's Dormu kind of future time dragon uh, business as far as bad guys go with this, or if we uh, we end up in the elemental realm with, you know, now drag uh, uh, Ragnaros with wings is now back or something, where he has legs and wings now. Um, you know, like what, whatever. He that just gets more being. legs. He just keeps getting more, extra just legs. legs. He's back. now a centaur that moves around. Yeah. yeah just yeah. keep adding legs on the right. Exactly. Regular. He's will be, eventually be a centipede that moves around. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I it's you know, we'll, we'll see we'll see what happens with it. I I do still stand by my belief that the best way to get people excited about an expansion is to make a clear goal and objective of what people are doing. Mm -hmm. And hey, the goal for the expansion is to go and explore the Dragon Isles is something that leaves a lot of uh, questions on the table. Um, that being said, because we're going back to Azeroth, I think a lot of people are just overlooking anything about the big bad. I think a lot of people are just like, I just want to get in here and be back on Azeroth and have dragons and have my, you know, real true RPG kind of experience back. Please and thank you. Yeah, and I think in the end, having Jailer front and center from Square One and Shadowlands didn't really work out. Like it didn't, it didn't add anything to the expansion narratively. I think Jailer is an okay bad guy, mostly enhanced by the Sylvanas novel. Well, it was, the, less it was so. the fake out, man. There was, it was the Sylvanas yeah. is the bad guy, fake out to Jailer is the bad guy. Was the that was the? Yeah, but they also put. I mean, they put Jailer right there. Like you know, the the, yeah. in, the Maw intro, like he's there. You know, he's he's a looming presence from from the beginning, and uh, you know, it's just he's not as compelling a character to WoW players as Illidan was, or Arthas, or uh, you know, Deathwing was, for example. Um, I mean, my assumption with this expansion narratively or like in terms of big, bad expansion boss has been Murazan from the beginning, you know, which is sort yeah. of the, the time shunted infinite dragon flight, you know, evil reflection of Nas Dormu. Yep. Um, it's something that's been out there for a really long time and it's never, you know, we, we've seen bits and pieces of infinite dragon flight stuff here and there, but it's never been dungeon about front, it, front and center. So yeah. there's a, there's a couple, right? Yeah. Like they, they show up in, in the, in a lot of the, uh, caverns, time dungeons and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they've been looming for a long time. So I, I think that would be, that would be kind of like a, a layup for, you know, what in terms of narrative progression and, you know, final raid boss or something like it would just work. I think I don't think this is a hard sell for a lot of players though narratively and in terms of, you know, what our objective is because they've been kind of hinting at the Dragon Isles uh, really since Miss of Pandaria, right? When uh when Rathian debuted and started becoming a, a player in the, in the overall story. So uh yeah, I don't know. I don't I don't I don't think uh, like obviously the first raid is is sort of focused on these primalists and, and this new evil or, or antagonistic dragon who, who they're working with. And, you know, that's what we have seen in the stuff they've released so far. And we know we're moving into that. I think it's a perfectly fine way to, to intro it. And yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if it, if it moves forward in, in that direction, I think it'd be cool. I, I think infinite dragon flood and Murzon would be a great direction for it to go. It's my expectation. If it ends up being, I, I guess the good thing about that is if it ends up being something different, I'm not going to be like disappointed, you know, <laughs> I yeah. feel like Murazond is like the perfect replacement level end of expansion boss because Murazond is a big enough threat that you're like, okay, Murazond deserves to be the boss at the end of an expansion. Right. Yeah. But if they, if, if they go in a different direction, it's not going to be like, Oh, I really wish we got that Murazond fight. Like I'm not going to be broken up about it. Agreed. I, I, I also, if, if I had to make a, a plot prediction, it would be, 
uh, the evil that we fight in the first act of this, so in season one of this, is actually only evil because they're trying to stop the bronze dragon flight from becoming evil with Murazond. And in chapter two, we team up with the evil we fought in chapter one to fight, start fighting back against what could be happening in big danger stuff. Cut, cool. to, cut to at act three, we defeat big danger stuff. Um, yeah, that's, you know, uh, what, uh, what, what would be the easy plot thread for ele elevator pitch and I can see it happening. So, I mean, maybe I'll clip this later on when it actually happens and we'll, you know, just use it later. All right. Yeah. When the, when the primalists like destroy Azeroth and yeah. <laughs> everything goes wrong, we're floating on a hunk of Azeroth in, 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 in outer space. Yeah. Like, uh, I guess we didn't team up with them after all. <laughs> All right, next one comes in from Zahar, who says, Hey guys, first off, you rock, and my apologies for the wall of text. Well, that's fine. Uh, my thoughts on season four, M plus has been awesome. The Shrouded Affix works really well, and in my opinion, the best season Affix of the expansion. The continuous stat boosts uh, as you progress through the dungeon just feel good. And as for the dungeons themselves, Junkyard is just plain fun to churn through. Uh, being wide open allows for some big chunky pulls without having to pull too much about, uh, sorry, without having to worry too much about line of sight or... Uh, aggroing other packs. Yeah, the final boss intermission is annoying, but it's never a, a you know, wipe inducing. Uh, so there's that. Kara is still Kara, but it, along with other painful dungeons, Grim Rail, uh, should only get easier each week. I feel the Dinar system is spot on, having a system where you can get that best in slot item as quick as possible, or have the option to save them up uh, and just sort of, you know, get that one item you've never been able to get. I uh, like the Sylvanas daggers is really needed and welcome. I'm looking forward to two dinars next week, but since I lucked out and got my best in slot trinket week one, I'm not really sure what to spend my third dinar on this time. The upgrade token needs work though. I don't feel they align with the rest of the system. Faded rating though, I don't know. The affixes, while interesting, don't add a dynamic to the encounter and are more annoying than they need to be. I really don't like having to reprog as well. I know it gets easier each time around, but I think where raids are going uh, to feel in round three, this is where they should have been in round one. Uh, yeah, no, I, I agree that, I mean, we've been nerfing and nerfing and nerfing every week, and I think things should have just launched at that point, and a lot of that just comes down to Blizzard being really cautious about the season. So overall, I think it sounds like you're having a really good time in season four, which is cool. All right, question to us. Do you think implementing a Dinar-like system to the whole leveling experience uh, to to be an interesting hypothetical? Oh, okay. So, like, a Dinar-like system for the entire leveling experience? Like, as we level up, we earn progression towards when we hit max level getting a really big, awesome piece of gear? Or as we level up... I, I, I'm confused because right now, the leveling experience has the Dinar system. Because so many quests out there, when you complete them, go, choose your reward, and you choose one of four items. It's like getting 30 faded boss kills exactly. in eight minutes. Um, so that exists in that sense. But if you're referring to, like, the uh, Dinar system being when you hit max level, you pick a powerful piece, I would rather that be, um, again, something that is sort of like a sign from a quest. Like, I, I've always appreciated those really big either elite quests or culminative story quests that go choose a weapon and it's like a you know four weapons and there's a two-hander uh you know a staff a one-handed axe a dagger whatever it is right that you can choose from that is that feels like oh this is 20 item levels over what i have and it's epic and that's cool great um so i i, I guess i don't fully understand the implications of what you're going for with your question uh, because leveling wise, um, well, I, I don't know how it fits in. Do I think they should have a dinar system like this in the next expansion? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. If we're talking about should this be in Dragonflight season one? Yes, I, I'd say hundred percent. Maybe change like I think changes the way ciphers work are welcome. Yeah, and expectations to or acquiring ciphers not the way they work, but the way you acquire them. And changes to the timeline, I think, would be expected in terms of how fast you start earning these mega powerful items. But if we're in a longer term season, it might be better to not have such a hard cap on how many of them you can get. Because it would be a benefit to keep continuing to invest in the game, right? And show up every week with your team and kill bosses. Maybe remove the dinar cap 
but roll it out a little bit, like make the first one take like five weeks to get or four weeks to get. So people aren't, you know, just instantly blowing up content and boss drops like literally don't matter at all. Um, yeah, I, uh, uh, now as far as adding it to, if we're talking about leveling, like level up from 60 to 70, no, I, you, there's plenty of rewards in the, in the questing system. If you don't, if you're not coming into Dragonflight raid geared, if you are not um, taking, I, I assume there's going to be some kind of catch up uh, experience, you know, in pre patch, some kind of, you know, elemental invasion or something, right. or what have you, that is going to provide catch up gear to alts that didn't do Xerath Mortis or something. So if you're coming in without any of that, from what I've seen on Alpha, you're going to be acquiring item level really quick and you're going to be, you know, ready to get into season one end game. Um, I don't, I don't think the leveling system really needs anything radically different in terms of, you know, power rewards or anything. But, um, if we're talking about, you know, level like post max level progression, power progression over the course of an expansion. Yeah. We should just, I, it's almost like, how do we even go back, dude? Yeah. How do we go back to where we were before? We, you know, now, now that we know what it can be like, how do, how do we go back without it? I mean, I guess the only thing I think of is that in this season, because we have three faded raids, there are so many potential items you can buy that three choices is, is it's, they're very impactful because there's so many different things you can choose. And in a world where we just have one raid in the pool, that three dinar might actually be overkill because there's, there's only, you know, it's probably more items than you even want necessarily off the table. So, you know, stuff might need to move around a little bit, but I think the fundamental idea is so strong that, you know, we you can you can tweak elements of it to suit the current content pool. Agreed. All right, Arajian comes up next and says, "I thought I would hate having all old all the old dungeons, but I ended up liking it. However, Grimrel Depot should never have been in the pool. Uh, it is a horrible dungeon that should never have been considered for a Keystone dungeon. And the most and the most of the people who voted for it were trolling for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it is what it is. Unfortunate." but we ended up with it. Uh, by contrast, I like the other dungeons, even Lower Karazhan, which is overtuned, is awesome thematically. From a cool factor, I think Karazhan is maybe the best dungeon in the game. I love getting the chance to experience it, uh, experience it because if they hadn't made it current, I wouldn't have. Um, yeah, I mean, if you never saw Kara before, uh, it's a pretty wicked space to be in. I wish the chess event worked like the old chess event to a certain degree. It wouldn't work in Keystone Dungeons, but cool event back in the day. Uh, one thing they could do to make it easier to learn uh, the old dungeons is allowing is allow running them on Mythic at current season Mythic Zero tuning. Uh, I started started the season with a plus 15 key, and it's challenging to go into a dungeon you've never done before on a plus 15. If you run any of the old dungeons on Mythic, everything dies in a single hit, so you don't get to learn uh, mob and boss abilities. Okay, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that's that's a pretty good stance on that for sure. Okay, what change to your main class coming in Dragonflight are you most excited about? Jason, you go first. Okay. Um, I'm excited about a lot of the stuff they're doing for Warrior, actually, but this sort of isn't difficult for me because there's one thing that stands out the most uh, from what I've played so far, which is a new ability called Shield Charge. It's kind of like charge plus, uh, I don't even know, charge plus uh, the reprisal legendary we've been using plus something else maybe. Um, it's It works like charge. It's a longer cooldown. It's 45 seconds, but it stuns your primary target for four seconds. It also does like a not insignificant, like a shield slam amount of damage or maybe more to your primary target. And it does splash damage to uncapped around your primary target. It also generates 50 rage and you can purchase a talent modifier in the tree to then also give it the reprisal effect where you get automatic four seconds of shield block uptime and a revenge proc. Um, and they were talking about how in, in on the forums, uh, it was a post from Kyvax was talking about how they felt like shield charge wasn't competitive enough. I was I started playing around with it. I'm like, this is going to get nerfed because it's just way too good. 
And it sounds like what they're going to do is they're going to remove the uh, the minimum range on it. So you can just like hit it in melee every 45 seconds, if that's what they end up doing. Um, the ability is super fun to use. It's super high impact. It fits perfectly with what Warrior's trying to do. Um, it's great outdoors. It has unlimited applications in dungeon and raid, especially if, if they take the minimum range off of it. I couldn't be happier getting something like that in our toolkit, you know. Prot Warrior already has a lot of buttons, but if you give me something like this, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to complain about having to f smash it into my hotkeys somewhere. Um, really, like whenever I'm evaluating an ability, it's like how rage efficient is it? You know, like how it, it all kind of boils down to rage throughput. And something like this that generates that much rage and also uh, with another talent point all, saves you the 30 rage or whatever it is for the, the shield block too or at least for a little bit. I mean, this is a perfect opener in a dungeon trash pack. Um, yeah, just really super cool design, super fun to use. And I, I think they're doing a lot of really cool stuff. Like a build went out, was it, I guess it wasn't this week's, it was last week's build. And they opened up the prot tree significantly in terms of being able to move from one side of the tree to the other, like not having to go all the way down one side. Um, I felt like you could really pick and choose what was appropriate for what you were trying to do. Um, but for me, yeah, that, that's that been the big highlight so far of, like, new stuff. You know, the, the new shiny is definitely a shield charge for me. Cool. Uh, my my class, I mean, I'll just be brief because it's not super exciting. Um, the, from, from what I've heard, the Druid and Priest class designers left the team shortly after the initial post of the talent trees for Druids. So there have been literally no changes to our talent trees since the initial preview went live. So much so that... During an interview with Ian yesterday, he openly admitted that these classes have not received any attention the way that they need to be and that they're going to be actively working towards getting that attention there because the fact that the preview, the very first class previewed was Druid, has had zero changes since that happened, whereas a lot of other classes have received multiple changes, Hunters being like a weekly change is something that is not okay, and so they're looking at that. My assumption is they're trying to hire someone or find someone on the team who wants that role and is looking at doing that, and that is taking time. That is that is the assumption I have, which makes me be in a lot of turmoil for where Dru the Druid class might be at in Dragonflight, since they've essentially lost months of development time on that class. Um, and the talents that we initially got in that preview uh, and the calculator that's, that's currently in the game right now that you can actually go on talent into has a huge amount of holes in it uh, that need to get addressed. And there's been a obscene amount of feedback because it was one of the first ones previewed um, about what needs to be changed for it. So it's a fairly large undertaking right now to step into wh whoever's stepping into the shoes for designing for the Druid tree to start filtering through months worth of feedback to understand what you know might need to change and how it should change for the class since it doesn't seem like really anyone that I've talked to has been very happy with particularly the rest of Druid or Balance Trees at all. Um, and they've already, I think the one change that it looked like they were talking about making was removing one of the fun things about the Guardian Tree with sort of the Moonfire spam that was going on doing just obscene amounts of damage with it. Uh, so yeah, not, not super great so far as far as my class goes. But what um, Aragian mentions is the potential for Paladin battle res. And that was something that was mentioned uh, during the same Ian interview, is they're looking at adding um, heroism slash bloodlust, whatever it is you want to call it, to evokers, and that they want to add another class in the game that has a battle res. And for some reason, Ian said the word Paladin, um, which I think is really interesting, because... Uh, as, as I, I don't want, I don't want Arajin to feel bad. If you get your battle res, then congratulations. Good for you. I think that's great. Um, but Holy Paladins are the most utility based healers in the game that every single raid team runs. Uh, there isn't a raid team on the planet that does not want a Paladin, in, uh, Holy Paladin in on a fight. They do an crazy amount of melee based healing, uh, to their melee group, as well as they pretty much single-handedly keep tanks alive. Um, so they're almost a mandatory healer to have on your raid team. Not, not running one is a, a noticeable, uh, issue. On top of that, they have, um, all of their bops and bubbles and lays on, lay on hands. They also have, uh, their, um, aura mastery, which reduces raid wide damage taken. Um, so they also, uh, have it, have a, um, damage reduction 
which is one of the most powerful things in the game, which is why Discipline Priests are so strong as well, is because they reduce the damage people take before they take it, as opposed to trying to recover from it. Um, so adding a, a battle res onto that class would solidify Paladins in a very, 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 you'll, you'll never not run one position for both raiding and Mythic Plus. Um, I think there's benefits to running Mythic Plus with other healers, but, and certainly Priest has been very popular uh, throughout this expansion, but I think Paladins would come back very strong if they had a battle res. Um, it also bumps Druids as a DPS class pretty much entirely out of that Mythic Plus pool, because why would you need one since you already have your battle res from your Paladin? Um, I think Monks would be a better choice personally for where a battle res should land. I think Monks have been very, very underrepresented inside a lot of healing situations, including Mythic Plus. Uh, they, the only main utility they bring outside of their, their life cocoon, which is a pretty weak cooldown to begin with, uh, is Revival, which is just a large dispel with a large heal, um, which isn't, it, it feels very niche as a big cooldown. So I think giving them something else to sort of try and include them inside of a dungeon running Mythic Plus situation, as well as uh, potentially um, bringing them in for uh, raiding more often inside a healing role would make sense. I would be curious about how they implement this. I imagine it's a talent that you spec into. If it is, it's about what you give up to get it. Uh, I, I feel like a lot of cases, Ret Paladins and Prop Paladins probably wouldn't give up a lot of what they currently have to be able to get a battle res. Um, I think that battle res, uh, if it was baseline, would be incredibly strong uh, to just give it to a class like that. And if it isn't baseline and it's something you talent into, how much DPS is a Ret Paladin giving up to get it? Because they're not going to take it, if that's the case. And uh, same thing with a Prop Paladin, how much survivability does a Prop Paladin have to give? Or... Is it a channeled or instant cast? Because if it's channeled, again, do you really want your prop pally doing it? Does it cost holy power inside the paladin situation? Are you giving up throughput in any kind of way or survivability or you know healing in any kind of way to cast that battle res? Sort of like a death knight having to use runes to do or use uh, energy, runic energy, runic power to do it. Um, you know, they, they actually sacrifice damage to be able to res people and they have to earn up enough uh, runic power to be able to res someone versus, you know, a Paladin would have to earn up enough Holy Power to be able to res someone. So in that case, if it's Holy Power based, does it just kind of become null and void? It's it's a tricky thing. I, I, I'm all for them adding another res. I think how they do it is going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. And if it ends up on Paladin, then, I mean, can, Paladins will continue to be the go-to best thing in the game to bring to everything. So that'll be, you know, you'll see them in all the, in all the M plus stuff. You'll see them in all the rating stuff. So, yeah. Let's put it on warrior. Yeah, sure. Give give warrior be res, and then just have it cost rage, and then they'll never use it because they never have enough rage because they constantly use the rage all the time. Yeah, well, that is kind of the way the class is designed. <laughs> yep, <laughs> it's like you generate a hundred rage as fast as you can and spend it as fast as you can. But exactly. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, we're now entering a world with thirteen classes, right? So. There's certain things you just kind of assume that you have access to or that you want to have access to. So, yeah. I mean, I assume that there will also be some semblance of an engineering battle res available in, in Dragonflight. Sure, so, sure. Um, but still, I, you know, I think you do need to, you need to round out some of this, these like expected uh, buffs, utility benefits as you expand the pool of, uh, you know, available classes because – you know, I don't know. It, the, obviously, a lot of people are going to come back for Dragonflight. It will attract some new players, but you're basically going to lose some of what people are playing now to go play Evokers, right? Like, you're going to have a lot of out-migration to Evokers, and you're probably not, you know, you're not going to see people, like, suddenly moving into other stuff, at least not at first, right? So that, that initial kind of honeymoon period with Evokers, I think it makes sense to probably you know, spread the utility around a little bit. And I mean, yeah, I think there's a lot of good reasons to bring Paladin with or without a battle res. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I do. Th I, th I think it's probably good to throw it in there somewhere though. Like give, give somebody else the opportunity to, to do it because it really sucks when you're, when your only option in like a dungeon or something is the engineering res. The thing that I'm shocked about that got talked about so much is adding the bloodlust, adding the battle res but they didn't talk at all about monks applying a physical damage increase or death knight or uh, sorry demon hunters applying a magical damage increase to, to bosses and being the only two classes that do that um or warriors having 
a shout that increases your attack power, mages having intellect buff that increases intellect. These are class specific buffs that are very powerful. Druid doesn't have one at the moment. And it means Druid's big thing is battle resing, uh, similarly to Warlocks not having something in particular at the moment. And so their big thing is battle resing. So as soon as you add a battle res to more classes, why is it that we're, we're essentially making it easier to replace certain classes, but you still have the fundamentals that it feels like you can't not bring to that rating environment? So I, I think that's a, a larger question that I, I, I'm going to wait to see what they choose to do. Obviously, these conversations are still ongoing uh, inside development, so we'll see what they actually say. But I, I, I am, as someone who uh, our raid team lost our, our uh, last Demon Hunter, uh, we lost a Demon Hunter a couple months ago, and we lost another Demon Hunter this past week just to a, a farther progressed team. They decided to jump quite high up in progression uh, going into to Dragonflight, so they made that move. They're actually going to be raiding with Automatic Jack, who's uh, another uh, streamer slash guy from Mythic Plus and everything like that for the MDI uh, caster. Um, uh, that's where where whatever our last demon hunter went. We're now in a situation where it's like, well, we don't have a demon hunter, which just means we don't have the increased spell damage taken on boss buff, period. And like, well, that that just feels bad. There's no there's no engineering thing. There's no you know no way to apply this demon no scroll. Yeah, like, there's no okay weapon like, oil or something. Yeah, you know, you you have to bring this class to just do a flat what is it five percent increased spell damage to a target. Like, mm -hmm. of course you want that in every single raid. So I, I feel like that's something more I'd like to see them look at a little bit. Yeah, I think this is a thing that can also be addressed to some degree by the overall goal of tuning and encounter design, right? Like you want this stuff to feel like a bonus, not a requirement. And, and the way kind of the difficulty ramp of raids over the last, I would say, I don't know, three, four years has gone. It's, you know, this stuff does become a requirement because how else are you ever supposed to complete these encounters and stuff? So I, I think in a world where maybe the that's leveled off a bit that, you know, maybe you can actually have situations where this stuff feels more like a bonus than a requirement just in order to enjoy the, the process of working on an encounter. But um, I don't know. I will see. They, they've kind of, said that they want to, you know, that Sepulchre was a mistake and that they want to dial it back. And I want to see that happen. Yeah, I want to see that happen since it didn't happen in season four. All right. Uh, this comes in from Case Lock, who says, if you guys were making a sports team, uh, you guys pick the sport, city, team name, mascot, etc., with a Warcraft theme, what would you call it? Did you have time to think about this one, Jason? I did, and I have absolutely nothing. I have nothing? <laughs> yeah. Nothing. Uh, geez. Um, I didn't have time to think about it, but it just sort of dropped in my lap. Well, the problem, the problem here for me was that, you know, in case is talking about, um, DJs and ZTH yeah. having a, a team, fantasy football league teams named after Murlocs and Tuscar. And those are like two of the best possible exit, like the Murlocs dude. That's a great, that's a great sports team mascot. I um, think, I think it would be a, um, uh, either a, probably, a baseball team called Varian's Rins is what I think I would call it. Okay. I like that. I just, I actually just thought of a great one. Uh, it'd probably be like a football team, I guess. Um, maybe like a hockey team. It, and it would strike fear into the hearts of all uh, Legion Dungeon Raiders uh, worldwide whenever they stepped on the field or the ice or whatever. It would be the Seagulls. Ah, okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Be, they'd be very physical. They'd be, you know, sure. be a stunning you, display of uh, athletic it. prowess. Yep. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I follow. All right, cool. Uh, this one comes in from Adam and Wow, who says, Personally, I'm quite disappointed with the season. Mythic Plus is okay-ish, but I had to learn all the old and new dungeons as I wasn't playing these in WAD, Legion, B Legion or BFA. So not really keen to min-max keys. Also, 20s aren't really a goal for me to push, as the teleports don't feel very rewarding. Not sure if I will bring my current main into Dragonflight. So yeah, I agree. If you're, I mean, the character locked, so that's the thing. Uh, faded raids don't hit the mark for me. The affixes feel either unimpactful, not fun, and or annoying. The rate, the reward system from the raid is pretty awesome for every active raider. As I don't have time to raid Mythic, it's not as rewarding for me though, and I think it leads to some strange incentives where people might prefer re-clearing the easier bosses over progressing into the harder ones. 
What I miss the most for uh, the season though, is the new single player daily loop content. I have zero reason to log in if I don't uh, have enough time to do a key or raid boss all of our wing, as I don't have any gold making goal at the moment, besides getting back my bio, besides getting my BOEs back. Uh, Blizzard just holding them hostage since 9.2.7. Oh, auction house problems, ugh. They should be in uh, your mailbox, but they aren't. Therefore, you're kind of in the 10.0 waiting room. Okay, well, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of things there, but I certainly don't think any of them are wrong. I think you're bang on with a lot of this comment. So yeah, you're right to feel that way for sure. Okay, question for us. What are your all-time favorite games besides World of Warcraft and, of, and besides other Blizzard games? Need some recommendations to fill the time until 10.0. Oh man, I got a whole bunch. Um, my all-time favorite game that I keep returning to all of the time is probably Frostpunk at the moment. Um, it's been that way for a couple of years now, so I feel like it just is living as one of my favorite games of all time now. Uh, Frostpunk is a uh, strategy-based game that's a survival strategy uh, in a future world where an ice age occurred. Uh, you are part of a civili civilization that's building generators to produce heat and people have to live within a radius of those generators. All the architecture in the game is gorgeous. Um, you build outwards in a spiral. Everything's built on that sort of arc curve. So the cities look magnificent. There's really challenging sort of moral decisions that you make. Um, it's hard to have any kind of campaign that you play through without there being some casualties or some moral sacrifices made. And when you complete a campaign, you actually get uh, a recap of all the decisions you made and the directions you went um, throughout, you know, producing laws and choosing laws and whether or not you're going to have religion or order or, you know, some sort of policing or what extreme do you go to, uh, how much sort of, you know, uh, silence do you enforce on people who speak out against your rule? That kind of, of decision-making, um, is all sort of recapped. And also at the same time, it, it shows you a time lapse of you building your city, which is just a really inspiring, cool thing to watch as a city slowly, beautifully builds its way out over time. And so, no, I, it's just a, it's a phenomenally well done game. So Frostpunk is one of the big ones up there. If you're looking for something really mellow, that's just enjoyable, uh, Power Wash Simulator is now out and, and uh, is in full swing. Um, you can sit down and play that game for four hours and just be like the most chill and relaxed and just mentally um, refreshed person. It's so nice. It's actually so nice that they now have brought in universities to do a study on people who play the game. So as you play through the game, you can choose to opt into this. You can get extra skins and whatnot for the game through just when you complete a level, you get a little survey pop up inside of the game, just talking about how you felt and how you're feeling now, uh, having played through that, which I think is really interesting. That's become almost a research study of how Zen and enjoyable of an experience Power Wash Simulator is. Um, so it's, it's cool. It's, it's really, I, I dig it. It's really rewarding. It's a fun one to just kind of zone out and do, um, of late, the game that I've been playing a lot is Atlas, but that's just because I'm doing a lot of role-playing, uh, play with, uh, with Josh Devalor, um, who now works for TikTok. I do a lot of, of RP stuff with him inside Atlas doing some pirating, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I would be lost if I didn't mention Dead by Daylight, uh, a game that I continuously return to. Uh, that is a game that I have almost 800 hours in, um, and it's uh, it's a, a game that has had ongoing development since it launched ages ago, um, and is super, super enjoyable to play if you're looking for a game that can have a really high skill cap if you want, or just be fun to sort of run around and have shenanigans in. Like, you don't necessarily have to uh, worry about playing extremely well all of the time. You can actually just do silly things if that's what you're looking to do and have a good time. Um, so yeah, always worth checking that game out. That game is, actually came out in two, uh, 2016. I was playing it in beta. And so it's been out for six years and they're still developing content for it like every two months. It's pretty surprising. How about you, Jason? Oh man. Um, in terms of like, so the question is all time favorite games, but also like need recommendations. Yeah. I, I, I cannot recommend any of my all-time favorite games that will probably fill time for you between now and the end of right. the year. Like my all-time favorite games are like Dr. Mario for NES. I was just playing it the other day. Um, I've been playing that game my whole life. It's a very it's special and important game to me. And uh, sure. 
I like to just kind of zone out, fire up some Dr. Mario on the Switch these days, and, you know, have a great time with it. Um, any permutation of Street Fighter 2 would also be on the list of all-time favorite games. I, I, I have bought that game on so many different platforms over the years, and sometimes I just need to, you know, fire up some Street Fighter 2 and play through it a little bit. Um, for one that's, like, actually still sort of relevant, even though it's out of, like, active development, I believe, these days, but... Slay the Spire is probably my favorite like new release game of the last ten years or so. I sometimes I just get in these modes where I gotta I gotta just sit down and play Slay like for a few hours. Like super fun, like turn based RPG meets card battler deck builder rogue like. I'm sure you know what Slay the Spire is. I mean, it's not it's not like it's some obscure game, but it's just a, a amazingly replayable, super super rewarding game to play. Um, I'm trying to think that, you know, that would probably be the one if I wasn't, if I, if I didn't have any wow stuff going on, that would probably be the thing that I would like pass time during the day when I had some downtime or whatever. You could also play it on like any platform imaginable, I think at this point. So uh, that helps, but I don't know. I, I always like in terms of like all time favorite, non wow, non blizzard games, it, the immediate things that stick with me are, are Dr. Mario and street fighter two. Like the, those games were just so important to me when I was young under games that I have revisited for 25, 30 years and enjoy every single time I start them. And there's not a lot of stuff in life you can say that about. Right. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Go grab your switch and fire up, uh, the, the NES, uh, emulator and play some Dr. Mario. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I only listed off games that I'm currently diving into, which you did too, with, uh, with your old switch that you still dive into and play those games with, but yeah, my, yeah, my all-time really, favorites goes much back of anything a long else, time. Yeah, well, like, yeah, that, that, I, I, yeah, I haven't played games that I would have on my all-time favorite list in a long time outside of Blizzard games like World of Warcraft. But yeah, it's been a yeah, while. like I, I haven't really gotten into any much of anything lately that outside of that sphere. You know, my my rotation is pretty much just like WoW, Hearthstone, and you know, some. I mean, like I I play the Pokemon series. So I played like legend legends Arceus when I came out in January, you know, that was a cool game, but it's not like that's something that I'm probably likely to revisit a lot, you know, and my my backlog's piling up because I just like, I just buy switch games. Like I I play switch games with the kids and stuff too. So pretty much any Nintendo first party stuff I just buy. And then, you know, maybe we play it for like a night and then the kids will play it, but I never end up circling back to it. So I don't, I don't really, I don't know. There's stuff I get like really absorbed in, but for the most part, uh, I wow is usually the main thing that's occupying my my brain. Yeah. yeah. All right. Next is from Shorl, who says, as far as M plus, I'm honestly loving getting to learn the new mega dungeons. Well, learn the mega dungeons, uh, even if I hate Moros. Well, I mean, fair. That is an easy boss to dislike. Uh, I'm doing low keys because I like the chill environment. It pr- uh, provides my group allowing our altaholics to bring in other characters. Plus my gear is not hor- not in a horrible spot for what we're doing. Uh, I'll also emphasize the nice thing about no Valor Cap means doing lower end dungeons is really viable because you can then just keep upgrading the pieces of gear, which I think is really nice. Um, this means I don't particularly care about the seasonal affix because I'm not doing it. I guess that's also a bonus. Uh, my raid team is back down to the usual five to six suspects. So we're doing LFR again. It makes me sad that because we couldn't LFR with uh, the Horde folk in the community, they stopped showing up. So we never got back up to 10 folks to step into normal. Uh, I've not got any huge goals for the end of the expansion. Fives across the board feel doable and I'm and is really all I'm setting myself up for right now. Okay. Yeah, I, I think it's weird that the um, auto finder, the dungeon finder kind of content is not cross-faction. We had this happen where we were going to, after raid, queue up uh, our raid team for LFR, but couldn't because six of our members were on Horde side. That felt really weird that you couldn't do Mm -hmm. that. Um, So I I feel like that's something that they made a decision around and then we're just back working on Dragonflight and never got around to revisiting again. And if we were going to be in season four for six more months, they would have 100% had a plan for at what point they could actually implement having cute cross-faction cues like that. Uh, so that's, I don't know. It's just yeah. unfortunate. 
Uh, I'm wondering. I'm wondering how much of that is a tech hurdle and how much of it is de- is a design decision. And you know how, what yeah. the the pie chart looks like there. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that implementing the tech will break stuff for a while, and well, it, it will did be, in arenas, right? We, we saw it in arenas. Right. It bro- We've yeah. We've already seen it break stuff in other venues. So, but you know, I I would imagine that they can probably make the tech function. I do feel like there's sort of this. Uh, reluctancy when it comes to match made stuff to throw the factions together. And like, I get that to some degree, but I don't think players really care. Yeah. Like, do you even notice if you're in a, in a cross faction rate? Like I have to, I'm not RP. I I have to actually check. Right. Like I'm, I'm not RPing dude. Like it's just, uh, that's not what's happening. Plus half the time, like most of my raids like transformed into bosses or using coin to many faces or they're Mr. Smite or whatever. Anyway, you know what I mean? It's like, it's it's just I, I feel like it's I guess it's good of them to have it more restrictive at the beginning, but I feel like it's really unnecessary. It should be opt out. You should have to opt out of cross faction match Agreed. made queues. Yeah, and, and like who, dude? LFR. Like, do you really care if there's somebody in the other faction in your LFR group? If you do, like that's uh, that's valid. Like you're allowed to care about that, but I don't know. Any, I, I mean, I talk to a lot of people around World of Warcraft, right? Like <laughs> between the people I play with and all the people that we talk to as part of doing the show, I have not heard anybody be like cross factions ruining the game for me. I, my immersion has been destroyed. I can no longer do this. I cannot believe that there is a human in my raid. Like, I yeah, I like. You know, I just don't think it's a big deal to to your average player. I, I think to like the you know the the median WoW population just wants access to content and they want to be able to play with whoever they want to be able to play with, and they want those people to be able to play however they want, including their choice of you know cl- their race. So I don't know. I I think it'd be fine to make to make the matchmaking thing opt out instead of instead of opt in, but. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it, it could be it could be a bigger tech thing too. Like, tech could be a bigger yeah. part of the equation. In which case, it is going to take longer, and it will probably be a little bit rocky. So th- these are these are all factors. Yeah. Okay. Next is from Johnny Tra- Johnny Trask, who doesn't have a question for us, but starts off by saying, first off, I'm going to disagree with Spencer's dislike of the raid upgrade ciphers, which I think is referencing probably our last episode that we had a conversation about. However, I clarified my position on those at the top of this, so. I hope Johnny has a chance to listen to my opinion at the top of this, because I think this is yeah. not correct. Anyways. I don't know. Yeah, I, I mean, like, you expressed issues with the you have to kill the bosses, and there's probably a better way to time gate it out. And yeah. I sort of expressed that I don't like the fact that I feel like doing LFR and normal is an optimal idea for my character. So I, I think those are minor gripes overall. I, but, I, I, think it's a, I think it's a good and strong system that should persist, but I think it could be implemented differently. Well, Johnny goes on to say, I think that's probably been my favorite part of season four. I'm a heroic raider and I've personally been really enjoying the incentive to do lower content. I could take or leave LFR being included, but I enjoy crushing through normal for an extra chance at the drop. To me, it doesn't differ much from running plus twos for an extra chance at the drop. I will agree the quantity for the upgrade is probably too conservative, but I hope they carry it forward. Yeah, so as Jason sort of said, clarifying... Uh, just like I said at the top of the episode, um, I am all for the cipher system being included. Uh, I think LFR being included in earning ciphers is probably not something that I'm a huge fan of. Um, I did and uh, was fine to log in and run LFR, normal, heroic, and mythic to try and get a trinket that I really wanted. Uh, that didn't bother me as something to do. That was extra ways to try and earn the item, and I liked that there were extra ways to try and earn the item. I will say that if that was something that I was doing every single week, it would get old for me very quickly. I think at the beginning of a season, it's cool to sort of like hop in and try and do a little bit of extra play time to try and earn an edge or earn something. If I was running those four difficulties every week for a month and a half or two months and I hadn't earned it yet, I would be very upset, which is where the dinar kind of kicks in to sort of help you with that and alleviate that. But that's kind of, you know, the mentality you have to have of if you're unlucky, for a long period of time, and your weapon's the thing you're buying with Dinar, so you're trying to get a trinket, because the weapon's the thing that's really the largest upgrade for you, so you're talking about next Dinar, which means, like, you're going five weeks, and you haven't gotten it in those five weeks, that starts to feel pretty bad. 
um, at that point, as it feels like a kind of a, a semi-necessary thing for you to do. So, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I like the idea of being able to upgrade normal and heroic loot. Um, I think there's better ways to do ciphers, which I talked about at the top of the episode. Anyways, you continue on. And Johnny says, as for the comments on the quantity of ciphers for Mythic, I'm going to reference Ian's interview with Max. Uh, I'm a little bitter as I don't like the answer, but he, he was asked about changing the, this, this was him saying he's a little bitter. I actually haven't watched the interview all the way through yet. So I, I don't actually know the exact wording on this. Uh, but Johnny says he was asked about changing the mythic lockout to better support pugs, uh, being public groups. And the response was effectively mythic isn't for pugs, isn't for public groups. So if I'm incidentally excluded from mythic content because my group is eight to 10 people, it seems only fair that players benched for parts of mythic raid are slower to accrue upgrades. This seems directly in line with Blizzard's current philosophy. We all just need to find that mythic 20 person group that should never, that, that never has scheduling issues. And then we can all get all the upgrades we want. Though I do agree that the ciphers required should be less than what they were settled on. So I want to digest this a little bit in this, in this sort of position, because first and foremost, if Ian's response was that mythic isn't for pugs, I think that's a bad design philosophy because when you're essentially recruiting people to your team, you're pugging into raid teams and allowing cross faction and cross server pugs into mythics is something that they actively do. Like you unlock hall of fames it unlocks cross server raiding for mythic. And all of a sudden there's all these people cross faction raiding, which by the way is pugging into those groups. It fills out raid teams. It helps people make friends. So I, I don't, if that was the response that Ian gave, I don't understand that at all. If Max said that mythic isn't for pugs, I mean, Max raids inside a mythic world. It's absolutely possible that his perspective on the game is different from everybody else's, and that's fine. Um, I disagree with that comment. Uh, but to then go on and say that, um, I guess, it only seems fair that players who are benched as parts of mythic teams accrue them slower, I don't think that is fair. I think everyone on the raid team offers absolutely equal amounts of effort towards killing bosses. Uh, it ties into your, your second point of find that 20 person group that never has scheduling issues. You would never clear a mythic raid with exactly a 20 person group. You know why? Bosses like Sludge Fist exist. Your 20 person group would have to be majority ranged because you couldn't bring more than six melee to Sludge Fist and kill that boss. And that included healers, which meant if you had a paladin and a monk who both count as melee, you could then have your tanks and then two other melee. And that was your melee group for that boss a lot of the time when you were doing progression. Because otherwise, people just couldn't spread out far enough and the boss just became incredibly complicated to try and do. So you need to have a roster to do mythic content because you need to be able to swap in and out classes. Now, you might not be very serious in your comment about 20-person group never has scheduling issues, obviously. Um, but it's just that that thought of to clear mythic content, it's an accepted thing that people have groups that are larger than 20 people or people are pugging in people on a regular basis and they aren't necessarily always clearing that mythic content, but they're killing a few mythic bosses and then hitting some sort of wall. And that's why we see group finder groups with we're three of 10 looking for four healers or whatever it is, right? Because they managed to get three bosses in the last time they did it. And now they're trying to get one or two more bosses and see if they can. Um, so it's, it's a overall an, um, one of those things where I, I think once you hear the, the top of the show, me talking about ciphers, you'll be more on board with what I'm saying, I would hope. Uh, and I, I disagree entirely. If Ian said that mythic isn't for pugs, I think that's just, that's just wrong. I <laughs> think it's just wrong. It's not in the spirit of the game. Well, you can plug it if you want to, but how successful are you going to be? You know, uh, that, um, my thought is that it's not something that I would want to pug or, sure. you know, sure. do in a pug or invite a pug to as a, now there's uh, recruiting tools and trial runs and stuff like that. But yep. uh, to me, that's not, that's not pugging, you know? And I think if you are trying to throw a group of people with no prior experience playing and working together, you know, to do the hardest content in the game. Yeah. You know, it's a buyer beware at that point. Right. Like I, I think if they, uh, at the same time, I think that rating in general has been too hard and, and has trended to be too difficult in the last two expansions. Um, so that is, might be part of the puzzle as well, but just kind of, you know, 
from the standpoint of what is the function of mythic rating, right? It's to be the most challenging large group content in the game. And it's to be tuned tightly around a 20 player group. And that is why it is the only current raid difficulty that has a size restriction and, and a static raid size. So, you know, that's, and we we've known it that way since what, uh, warlords. Yeah. Since warlords. So, you know, it's been eight years now. Maybe there's, maybe it's time to reevaluate that, but that, that is the function of mythic rating, right? Is to be the highest level, the highest difficulty challenge available. And the way they can really make it that way is to set the, you know, the standard group size. Um, flex rating was a huge boon to the game, but it doesn't, doesn't work. You can't, you can't have mythic be what it is. If you allow, flex rating and like flexible group sizes. And this, I'm saying this as somebody who for eight years has had this problem of, I have 30 people the night a raid opens. And by the time I'm finished with heroic Prague, I have 22 people. And by the time we kill the first boss on mythic, I have 18 people or yeah. less for the rest of the season. Like flex mythic would drastically benefit my team especially if I could like cut some of the lower performers and have like a 15 man. Well, that's what you'd see. 12 right? that, man. That's the, that's the right? big problem, right? Is, is yeah. you yeah. think would suddenly become a, what's, what's the minimum amount right. of people you can bring that or would, maximum, that's what right? Like what's, right. what's the break point? What's the correct number of people to do this encounter with? Well, like that, this is what, you know, yeah. up or down. Right. And it's like, yeah. that's, it's just, yeah, this is, this is why it is the way it is. I mean, yeah. I, I, I think if, I think there could be an opportunity to see a, a philosophy shift in, in terms of the way that these systems have worked. I don't know. I mean, it's been a long time that we've had this structure, right? Probably longer than any existing single structure ever lasted. It's got to be. So I, I wouldn't be against them mixing it up, but they're not like in, in the absence of them doing that, then I think that, you know, you have to have static raid size for mythic and it has to be, it has to be the way it is in this context because otherwise it doesn't function. Yeah. The only uh, structure that's older than this, Jason, is the uh, the chat box that scrolls your text off. <laughs> yeah, the, the chat no, window, that's yeah. The, that's the, the, IR, the RSC chat exactly, at the bottom yeah. of the screen. But they need to fax. Um, all right, so to continue on Johnny's uh, comment here, for the raid affix, I'll simply agree with others saying it was not well executed. I like the idea of an affix, but I'd prefer to see something more opt-in. Uh, the wipes my group did encounter seem mostly to come from having to adjust to the affixes uh, or having the affixes go off at, inappro at inappropriate times. Um, I've been having a ton of fun with Mythic Plus, though. I was a healer for Season 3 and decided to try tanking for Season 4. The uncapped Valor and all the new uh, gear took a lot of pressure off me uh, to gear up. I was quickly able to catch up with my other friends from Season 3 and uh, chasing for, uh, for the upgrades. Hoping a lot carries forward here. No, I, I agree with you entirely on that. So, yeah, I think overall. Yeah, that's uh, the good stuff about yeah, Mythic Plus, man. So sure. good. Yeah. All right. Well, that's... I had I had one. I want to bounce something off you before sure. we go. Because okay. okay. I had a, this, this reminded me of a weird thought that sure. I had while I was doing Faded Heroic Nathria this week. What if in the Faded Raid, the affixes were on the trash? So you just use them to blow up the trash and get to the boss. So you could leave the affixes in there. But they were they were to help you smooth out trash pulls instead of make the bosses more complicated. Uh, so uh, I know a lot of people who AFK during trash, and <laughs> I feel like you'd have more critical issues by making trash more but complicated. Would they AFK if they could get eighty percent increased damage for thirty seconds every every other trash pull or something? Yeah, I I, I would almost mm. I would almost wish that there was the affix was when you kill a boss. Your entire raid team gets a buff that makes them do eighty percent more damage for three minutes or whatever it is. That'd be cool. And so the That'd goal was too. kill the boss and race as fast as possible to the next boss um, through all the trash. That to me would be it would just clear when you pull the next boss. But that to me would be way more interesting because as is the majority of mythic raid teams that I know just skip trash. They just death run from boss to boss to boss to boss, just not killing yeah. trash because it's faster than killing it. Um, Rigalon and uh, is, is like a great example of that. You kill Lords of Dread. And you literally, everyone mounts up, rides over to Rigalon's room, pulling all the trash with them, and then just dies in Rigalon's room. Someone takes a soul stone, reses everyone, and then you just do Rigalon. Because why do the trash? Like, it's just, you make sure you have a soul stone every time, and yeah. you never worry about it. So it's uh, it's one of those odd things of, I'd much rather them 
put a buff that you get for killing a boss that makes you do increased damage for a, a window of time after killing that boss. Um, which means that you could then plow through trash, which would feel really good. That would be really as cool, long as yeah. they didn't design trash around you having the buff, which is what I'd be afraid Blizzard would <laughs> just do. Buff all the trash, fifteen yeah, percent. Like, yeah. what are you uh, doing, guys? Just let us be strong. So, we just yeah. want you to not be strong. We want you to be strong, but not stronger than you were before. Right. Yeah. It's just, anyways. Um, that's going to wrap up episode five thirty eight of the Starting Zone. Uh, what a great patron uh, episode show! My goodness. So many questions, so many great uh, thoughts on, on season four. I'm so glad we asked that question. If you want to check out show notes for this episode, which is just sort of a list of questions that uh, were asked to us, then feel free to leave us a comment on the show. Head on over to thestartingzone.com, the official website for the Starting Zone podcast. If you want to contact the show, leave us your feedback, ask an email. You can do that at thestartingzone at gmail.com or reach out to us on Twitter. Or you can join the Starting Zone Discord over at thestartingzone.com slash discord. Jason, where can folks find you on the internet? Uh, the best place to find me is over on Twitter. You can find me over there at Shieldwald, and you can also find me streaming WoW over on twitch.tv slash Shieldwald. Uh, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Sunday nights at 7.30 Eastern for Faded Raids and Keystones and all that stuff, and uh, Alpha Streams Mondays around 8 o'clock or so. Uh, yeah, do you know, checking out Dragonflight stuff. Maybe beta soon. I don't know when that's going to be, but uh, yeah, check that out. I just wanted to say, like, you know, if we're... Let's say we're let's say we're three months out from expansion right now. When have we ever had this much stuff to talk about? I know, about, like actual live wow. Yeah, with this many people chiming in on on patron shows, like for better or for worse, it's it's the best thing they've done for an expansion tale. I would say ever for engagement. Yeah, like if people are more engaged right now than they've ever been for any expansion tale. So and it's mostly yeah. fun. I mean, yeah, like yes, we, we're talking about some of the some of the downsides or the blemishes, but I mean, I, I think on balance, it's it's a big win. Yeah. If you're trying to find me, you can find me on Twitter at Spencer underscore Downey over on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spencer HD. Another big shout out and thank you to all of our patrons for supporting us and helping us do episodes like this and contributing to them. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, with that, for Jason and myself, we want to say thanks for listening and jobs done. Hi everyone, I'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons. They contribute a ton to our show and help us to improve on the content we create. Today I'm giving a special shout out to Arajian, Celian, Infark, Kapawi, Mibble the Mighty, Nick, and Shoral. Thank you! This sounder is for you!